All right, ladies and gentlemen, I meant to get this podcast to you a couple months ago, but like I said previously, life got in the way a little bit. I was able to sit down with John Dudley and John Barklow for just about two hours and start to dig into some survival-based questions. And I received many more questions than we were able to answer, but what I tried to do was take a broad cross-section of all of the questions that I was, in fact, asked, uh, put them in front of them, and we kind of answer them uh, in a collaborative fashion. And this is the first of, uh, I would say, at least two or three more. So this I'm going to call the Survival Podcast 101. Um, This is for the people maybe not necessarily hunting specific, just generally outdoor specific, uh, but it's our first dipping our toes into the pool of the survival questions. So I'm not going to say too much. I'm just going to let you guys get into it because it's two hours of Q&A from your Q and RA. So here you go. Enjoy. Okay, got the red smoke. Third one, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, wait a minute, give it to me, I made it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. The only thing I saw turkey hunting was a cow that I took a picture of. And I've, got that, I've got that picture. <laughs> I love that, that picture. put its head into the blind. It's like s- Oprah was looking into the blind. Basically. Yeah. So I'm thinking we should call this Survival 101 because we're going to need to do 102. <laughs> are we recording already? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I oh actually God. think we need to see what we're going <laughs> to say first. Of course first. we are. <laughs> Before well, I hit we record, call it anything. I hit record because I can edit the in anytime we want to, but you, <laughs> you never know will, what's going to happen. You will not. I probably edit. won't. Yeah, that everyone. <laughs> so this was to cleared a, hot, totally hot and hard. Even though this episode is not brought to you by BlueChew.com, um, this should have happened in May. Life got in the way, and I got a ton of questions. So I have about seven that I think we'll cover. Getting right into business. Going right in there. Just well, that's what I'm saying. I'm trying to explain to you guys why I think we should call it Survival 101. Because I have way more questions than this, and I think we should do it again at some point. We can't overload people. Dude, we got three hours. Let's freaking bang them out. <sighs> do your longest cleared hot podcast ever. Oh man. <laughs> let's do the. Uh, let's do it the. Uh, the C H E the cleared hot experience. It, him three and Rogan hours. set the standard where they got up and pissed once each. You have to get up and piss twice. The first two now. times I didn't piss, but the last time I went, I didn't really know we were podcasting that day, so I had <laughs> I was I was deep, deep into the angels' wings, and he's like, he's like, should we do this? I'm like, are we doing it today? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, dude, I'm lit right now. I thought we were just shooting. So yeah, it. it uh, I w- I went into a dark place. That, that's what's fun with Snyder is. He doesn't drink, and it could be a 15-minute podcast, and he's got to get up and piss right in the middle of it. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm trying to fill time in the middle of the podcast Thanks while he's me peeing, know. and I'm like, so I just like talk. I'm just like talking and just giving this long-winded answer while he's in the bathroom. <laughs> okay, well, now I know not to invite him, whitetail hunting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 15-minute Rogan, not gonna Rogan was bad yeah. enough having to take a deuce off my number one <laughs> stand. I'm like... How Are you? He's like, dude, I got to shit. You're kidding me. Yeah, he MCT oiled up, and then he's freaking <laughs> totally doing uh, drywall mud splatter all, <laughs> all across my timber. Like on, number, on your number one stand. Number one. Yeah. Isn't that going to yeah. make the animals not come in that direction? We're yeah, not, we're live. We don't, we don't yeah. do live. <laughs> we're we could be live whenever. We're semi-live. recording, though. Semi-live. Yeah. We're recording. I'll I'll keep, I'll continue to, uh, no, I need to, to un- tell the I need to understand <laughs> what? why you stayed in those stands after that. Wouldn't that be We didn't. I was gonna say <laughs> what you always tell me is you can't beat their nose and if a dude is dr- hanging drywall in a tree stand, how are you <laughs> This is so this is hilarious. He because the deer's like there's nobody dumb enough to do this. <laughs> yeah. I mean I told Joe, I said, Hey, going in, I said, We're gonna we're literally going to be in a stand 13 hours. He's like, okay. You should be like. Uh, and I said, you got to you gotta know that we're going to be in 13 hours. He said, yeah, no problem. And he's so used to elk hunting. You're going, you're going, you're going, whereas this is a chess match. And yeah. I, wa- I really wanted him to get a really good whitetail. And those things, they're looking long before you see them. They're, I mean, a mature Midwestern whitetail. Where were they're, you guys? Oh, you were at your house. Yeah. I mm-hmm. Okay. And they're looking long before you see them. 
And he was, I said, all right, be real still. And he's like, okay. And I actually have video where he's just freaking bouncing. <laughs> you know, he's standing up and he's tight to the tree, but he's just like moving like an inch and a half up and down and up and down and up and down. And I'm just videoing the whole time. And then he looks at me and he's like, kind of gives me a thumbs up. I'm like, yep. <laughs> but uh, what we camo had, pattern was on his face? Was it the oh, cat? I, yeah, I painted the kitty cat. It was, <laughs> 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 and uh, he... We made it till about noon, and then he said, what, what do you think? And I said, man, I'm telling you, between 11 and 1 is my favorite time. And he's like, I got a shit right now. And I said, really? Like, bad? And he goes, yeah. And I said, all right. I go, he'll just go down quiet. I said, let your bow down because I said, you don't – I said, something might – I said, yeah. take your bow. And I said, if something comes, I'm just going to film you from up here. So then he kind of went off, uh, painted the woods – came tiptoeing back and literally got to the bottom of the tree shimmied up to the top of the tree and he's there like i don't know about 30 minutes i could just i could see it by like his fidgeting that i'm like he's not gonna be able to, like he wants to change spots and then he's like should we move somewhere else and i'm like if you want to i said but we're not <laughs> taking a break we're literally moving and getting in a tree and he's like, all right. So he freaking, I said, just go down real quiet, man. So he shimmies down the tree and he literally gets on the ground. All of a sudden I'm like, I just drop something and it like hits the ground next to him. He looks up at me and I point down the woods. <laughs> there was three bucks on a doe and they're just coming. And I, I literally, I go, get behind the tree. And it, he gets behind the tree. And then I, I told him, I kind of gestured as like, get the bow forward and i said i go if you can shoot just shoot i said i'll film him so he's on the ground and these bucks come through and this one with these he was like we called him big red just this real wide buck just real red in the face he literally comes into like 20 yards and joe's kind of sitting there like peeking around <laughs> each side of the tree and this buck just freaking pegs him like nothing <laughs> and they all run off and then he starts coming up the tree really quiet. And I go, dude, we're leaving now. And he goes, what? And I'm like, y it's blown. And he's like, really? And I go, yeah, they're not coming back ever. And he's like, oh. And I said, go down. So he got out, went to another spot. and then. Uh, but that, by ever, then, you mean ever. Well, I meant like probably, in the, probably that month. <laughs> what if they had busted you in the tree? I don't know. It's different, especially when there's three of them. I mean, it's not like it was one and he saw something he didn't really know what it was. Or sometimes when they smell you and don't really know that you're necessarily in that tree, like you could have been there a few minutes ago. But when they put all the pieces of the puzzle together, really mature animals, they don't need to be told twice that. So if they you know, see a dude in camo that looks like a cat with a bow, yeah, they're out. Cat face. <laughs> Uh, I think he had a hat on, so yeah. Oh, well, I mean, he literally and looked. smells like shit. They're like, we're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> smells like shit. Hands like <laughs> hands like Bigfoot. Yeah, freaking sharp broadhead pointing at him and painted like a cat face. They're like, we're out of here. What is this? We so, are going to Nebraska. Silverback just mounted a damn tree leopard <laughs> and shit on itself. And there's Rogan. <laughs> Yeah, it was uh it was a it was a fun hunt, but having never hunted with him, I would imagine he would struggle sitting still that long. Once once like he's he's great about he's very adaptive to anything. So a lot of times he listens and he some things he takes right away, but some things he almost wants it proven, <laughs> which is his personality because yeah. that's what he does on his podcast. He's yeah. always devil's advocate. Well, maybe they don't, you know, well, what if, what if, what if, or yeah. I don't know, what about this side? He always plays both sides, which is great, especially for what he does. Um, but in that case, you know, I think once, once he saw that animal and how it reacted versus interactions that he had with elk, he's like, oh, okay. And then from there on out, he was a rock. But he just needed, like, once he had that education, he realized I wasn't just being that weird about it. I was telling him the truth of yeah. these things are on high freaking alert. If you move and they can see you anywhere within their peripheral vision, they are going to pick you out. It's just, it's a different, it's a totally different thing than, you know, and when it's rut 
and they're on a doe, you have the ability to move around a lot more because they're occupied with themselves. But in that situation, when all three are coming and the lead one pegs you and then every other one's looking at you, like the word's out then. They they all know there was something there. And Why, you know, were, why were three of them hanging out together? Did they do they that? They were all on the doe. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they're just horny. It, yeah. It'd be no different than, you They know, had just taken their blue chew, 30 yeah. to 45 minutes. You can take it on a full stomach, Bark Low, just in case. <laughs> can I take it on an empty stomach? Yeah. Ooh. God damn it. I don't even know why I'm talking about it right now. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This episode is brought to you by It's Kill a totally Cliff, different animal, yeah. though. Like, it's a totally different game. Like, I've been kind of sort of okay brought with whitetail, but the, the only way I'm successful with whitetail is to sit, and not big ones, but I literally just sit there stubbornly sun up to sundown yep i actually have time in uh after i hunted with dud i went to montana and got a white tail my first day out Mm -hmm. sitting by a tree i just sitting by a tree zero experience and i happened to look over and i saw uh, i had a huge open field in front of me and i saw this thing moving off in the distance from right to left i'm like well sitting's not going to work and i had my earbud in because i was listening to rogan and uh jordan peterson on a podcast (laughs) kid you not so i stand up and i had my bow and i knocked an arrow and the thing just kept coming so i had ranged all these bushes i'm like all right 40 it kept coming and it kept coming and kept coming i'm like okay put the head down drew back first day out white tail hunting whap right on the spot (laughs) you might as well quit right now yeah white tails off the ground are tough Oh yeah, but he yeah he he aced it. But he, I mean, my, my success was sitting like you said, eleven to one. I think I killed three bucks in Missouri three years in a row, like between eleven forty-five and noon. Yep. See, well, to I me, told a, I would have thought again with low animal experience. I, the what do you guys always call it? The golden hour, the witching hour, right before sunset. That hour before into daylight, and then daylight into evening. In the middle of the day, I thought they're sleeping all the time. Mm, during the rut, it's a very good time yeah. because a lot of a lot of times they're very active throughout the the night, and then in that little window of you know the golden hour, morning and evening, but then they'll bed down, and because it's breeding season, like it's you know it's pedal to the metal, so they literally lay down long enough to like catch their breath, rest a bit, and then they there's a big midday movement normally. <laughs> If you have a hot doe in the area, it's very hit or miss, and and most honestly, most people miss it. But um, I was telling someone the other day, I had success in Iowa. It was kind of an anomaly. Um, back in the day, somehow I drew three non-resident tags three years in a row. Don't ask me how happened. Uh, and I shot a buck at eleven eleven. Then the next year I shot one at eleven twelve, um, and then the third year it was like eleven o'clock, and I told my camera guy I said I'm gonna stand up, and I stood up and I said uh, I go yeah I said I've shot bucks the last two years you know eleven 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 twelve <laughs> I said I better, and eleven ten my phone rings and it's Ulmer, and I see it's like ringing Randy Ulmer and I thought. He wouldn't be calling me unless he really needed something. So I go, hey, what's up? And he said, "Uh, are you in a tree? I go, yeah, it's November (laughs) 12th. And he goes, oh, okay. Uh, He goes, well, you see anything? I said, no, I'm not. I go, but, you know, I told him the last two years I've saw something 11.10, then 11.11. Or no, it was 11. I forgot what it was. 11.11, 11.10. Um, and he's like, oh, really? And then all of a sudden I go, Buck, hold on. <laughs> and I literally <laughs> was talking to him, and I look up, and there's one just coming right to me. So he's like, he's, I, as I'm pulling the phone down, it was like an old Motorola Flip, the real dinky one. <laughs> Did you have to bite the antenna and pull it up? <laughs> yes, yes. That's the one it was, the silver yep, one. that thing was money. And I'm, I'm like, hold on. And I just literally, I'm already standing, so I just set it down on my tree stand seat. And I grab my bow, and this buck just comes in, and he's not that big. But I think because of the fact I knew Ulmer was on hold, and I just draw back, and the <laughs> buck comes in, and he stops right at, like, 10 yards, and he's broadside. And then he just kind of turns and looks up to me and the camera guy. And I go, is he big enough? And the camera guy goes, goes for me. 
and I go, <laughs> <"Dear."> <laughs> I freaking smoked him. And then I pick the phone up and I'm like, hey. And Randy's like, did you shoot? I'm like, yeah, I got him. He's like, are you serious? I go, yeah, he's, d-. I go, he's down. He's like, what? I go, yeah, he's totally down. He rolled. And he's like, he goes, well, just call me back later. And I said, all right, <laughs> I'll call you back. <laughs> I, I uh, you have those experiences all the time, right, Barklow? Yeah, not that experience, but <laughs> I'm I, checking on our food. So I, you guys, I'm in tell Missouri, story. right? At Ten days, and you know, you want to hunt from dawn to dusk, and paying for this lease, and <clears throat> I had to do a call in the morning, you know, and of course that. So I was like, guys, I can't go out in the morning. I was kind of mad, and then you do the call, and then it runs late, and then you drive out there, and I was just pissed now because I was hoping to be sitting by ten. And now it's like 10.30 and I'm walking in. Oh, yeah, you're just rushing the clock. I hate that feeling. And I'm just, like, pissed. I'm, like, I'm wasting my time. Like, it's kind of like fishing where you can't see fish. Like, you know, am I just, like, the dumbest person ever? And <laughs> I literally, I climb up into the stand. I hook in. I pull my bow up. And it's just hanging there. No arrow on. Don't have a release on yet. And I'm kind of un, kind of sorting my stuff. And I hear something. I am facing the tree. I hear something behind me. And I grab my release which is, you know, a thumb trigger type release. I grab it in my hand, and I turn around, look over my shoulder, and here's a 10-point a buck walking underneath, like coming towards me. Yep. And I literally grab the bow, I knock an arrow, and he walks by, and I have to wait for – I mean, he's directly under my stand as I'm, like, ready to shoot, too close. And I literally just wait for him to start walking away and shoot this thing. And it was the only whitetail hunt. I was in my stand maybe 10 minutes – and I call, you know, text my buddy. I'm like, all right, I'm done. And he thinks I'm joking with him. I'm like, no, seriously, I've been in my stand for 10 minutes. I just shot a 10 point. Good God. And I, it's, but I, it doesn't work that way for me in whitetail. Like, you know, some, I, I don't know about you, but some species, like, work. For me, don't talk to me about hunting. No, I know. I've been and, hunting and for exactly 11 months. Like, <laughs> yeah. But, like, whitetails are tough. And I can sit there, like, I will just gut it out day after day after day. But they just, I don't know if I'm in the wrong spot or. I got in a tree a couple times in Montana and had some does walk by. I've never had like the 10 point buck walk underneath. Uh, I'm I'm waiting to have that experience. Montana is a little different too. For whitetail interaction, it would be like, it would probably be like me saying I had experience hunting elk in Tennessee or, you know, Wisconsin just opened a season Mm -hmm. because. They're just not pressured near as hard here in the western states yeah. as what they are in the Midwest. So it's it's kind of different, you know. It's I'm honestly it's like I'm more West... likely to hit them with my car. Like, oh I, yeah, I, they're suicidal by where I live. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a little different. Certain river bottom areas, like um, up on the Muscle Shell or up on the Milk, um, both of those areas is classic whitetail hunting where you can hunt them the same as what you would throughout the Midwest and South and East, but up where you're at where you have so much big timber too yeah it's kind of needle in a haystack stuff you know well yesterday it's a lot different directly out my front door there's a house being built in the neighborhood that we live in and there were two does bedded in the dirt Mm -hmm. not that i would have ranged it but from my son's room it might have been 37 and a half (laughs) (laughs) so yeah that was a needle in haystack it was a couple months too early but yeah i mean i'm actually more likely to hit him with my car than anything else where i live it was yeah it's been interesting i i don't the only experience i have in a tree stand was with you in georgia i think i like being on the ground better yeah moving around that wasn't even that was a I would I would classify that as a royal cluster. <laughs> cluster. I'm just saying I was in a tree stand for a longer period of time than I've ever been in. Is so this that, Alabama? It was Georgia. It was Georgia. Oh, Georgia. Yeah, that was, was the only time I've ever been mess. in a tree stand. No. I did get a doe. It's a, different, you, it's you, a totally different yeah, game. Yeah. If you're hunting, yeah. if you came and hunted where you where you put in the time and effort for whitetails that people, you know, out here out west, it's hard for me to, to write – articles for western style hunting i always feel awkward doing it because i'm an east you know i'm a midwestern slash eastern slash southern person coming out west to enjoy out west it's hard for me to write an article about western hunting when there's guys that are out here that shed hunt search maps 
search high and low through the summer, camp out here, put, you know, put cameras on water holes or wallows and spend a ton of time behind the glass spotting, trying to pattern stuff. Um, maybe even cut some trails in where they can to get to new areas. Whereas I'm, I'm that guy, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much like you guys coming to the Midwest where you say, Hey, I want to come hunt whitetails. I really enjoy hunting whitetails. It's fun. What's the best seven days to come? And it's like, well, you're yeah. going to come November 1 to November 14. And that's when every Tom, Dick and Harry in the world comes to the Midwest to hunt whitetails. And I'm Tom, Dick, and Harry coming out here, you know, September 7th to the September 30th. I'm trying to chase elk in some state. It's the same. But for whitetails, if you really, in like, put together all the parts of hunting a whitetail where you're putting in the food plots, you're – Like you do at your farm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or, or all the states that I hunt where I'm, you know, literally have cameras out. I'm taking a weekend that I have off to drive there to pull cards, to check those cards. And if I'm not seeing the traffic there that I need to, moving those to a new area, you know, trying to relocate stands or going there during the late season just so that I can look at, like, you know, put my drone up in the air, run it over snow to where I can see what travel paths are from – literally from the sky to where it's like wait a minute how money is that drone oh yeah yeah <laughs> i mean to to be able to look at things of wait a minute okay now i see yep. where the congestion is like where these pinch points are and then and then it's then it is really tactical it's at that point it's almost sniper like would you agree i mean no, i've never I been to sniper school well but that's what i've learned though from guys like you right and some other folks i know like in ohio and stuff that that's what they do they hunt whitetail how calculated and surgical it is like my buddy donnie i, I forget he caught he shot like two or three deer last year and i think the cumulative amount of time he actually sat in the tree stand yeah. was six hours mm -hmm. right where i'm literally going to missouri on a lease and i'm like i got these 10 days and i'm gonna sit there sun up to sundown yeah and he's like i will not go in there until i have a really good chance of killing that buck the first set. i'm the same uh, right and it's a, it shocks me i'm like there's a guy oh, well no wonder you enjoy yourself there's a guy who lives here in uh bozeman i have never met the dude uh he hit me up after the last time i was with joe on his podcast mm -hmm. named sean melland okay um he's been sending me pictures of bull elk for months for if you give away a spot, you are not going there. <laughs> no, no. I'll just say it's in Montana. So, but the th like he has been yeah. glassing, mm -hmm. patterning, they do. research, and he drops monster bull elk every year. Public land. He drew the nine hundred tech twenty. Yeah. Right is the tag we drew. I think that's what I drew. Yeah, I think it's a very general tag. And uh, I was actually texting with him, um, going over what to put in for it. it. Was the same one that covers the ranch that we'll be going to, but. You want to talk about a guy who's passionate and yeah, he's not guessing. I, the point I'm getting to is he's not guessing when he goes out there. He's like, he, I mean, from just listening to him talk, he's like, yeah, this is the bull that I'm going after. It's not, hey, I'm going to walk around until I see a bull. Yeah. It's like, no, this one that has a little bit of an atypical whatever it is, I'm going to hammer this guy because I've been watching him for three years. Yep. That's, yeah, that's that. That is that's the, the sniper school. Now, like that guy is taking it much more seriously than a guy who gets an airplane ticket for seven days. See, my the places that I hunt, collectively to some people it would seem big especially to western hunters it wouldn't seem like that much ground but over i have i think three different places that i can hunt and over those three places is probably a cumulative maybe 600 acres total and over that 600 acres i have probably 30 to 40 sets and i rarely i mean i can count on one hand the amount of times I'll sit the same set twice in a year. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And normally it's, I'm literally watching the weather thinking, okay, it's pre rut. I know that buck is in this area. This is the plot where the majority of the does are tonight's the night. I have the wind and I go in the amount of times where I've literally killed the buck that I want within the first day of me hunting 
is pretty high. I was I mean, watching you last year on your Instagram story, like payload or whatever the yeah, bucks pay, you were yeah. naming, and it's like, oh, hold on, there he is. Yeah. <laughs> well, and payload was my number one, and when I encountered him the first time, it was exactly where I thought that I would, but I didn't get the shot. He was on a doe. And because I hunted that place, I moved a mile and a half away to a completely different farm that I just had permission to hunt. It wasn't even my place. And I just went there because I knew there was a high concentration of does. And I knew the wind was really good for me to get in and out without anything knowing I was there or seeing me. And that just happened to be where he was, you know. It was, uh, there was a, actually, I think there was a few days break because, um, Ben came in Yep. and I just, after I missed that opportunity, I thought, well, I'm not going to see him again right now. Um, just because I knew looking at the forecast, the wind wasn't going to be favorable. And because I had seen him on a food plot, once it hits peak rut, bucks aren't going to be in a food plot. They're going to be in, they're going to be in cover. They're going to be in, you know, they're going to be in in bedding areas or areas where the does are able to get away from those bucks. So I just knew I wasn't going to see him there anymore. And then Ben flew in. So we actually, we were almost a mile, a different direction when Ben shot his buck. And then when he shot his buck, we took care of it. We cooked it for a, a for a Yeti story. And then, um, that next morning I said, you know, are you going to fly out early? He said, I'd really like to film you for a day. So he said, where are we going to go? And I told him, I don't, I don't know. We'll have to look in the morning. So in the morning we got up, you know, went and kind of got all our gear situated. And then I looked at pretty much looked at the hourly forecast of what the wind was going to do every single hour. And I said, okay, based on these swings, I've got to go here. And we went there and then sure enough, I mean, here comes a doe and payloads on her. And, you know, and I shot, and he's like, man, I shouldn't have shot the first one. I'm like, dude, you can't think that way. <laughs> this buck was a mile and a half away two days ago, you know, but I just knew that that location was going to play in our odds of where everything was in our favor for entry, exit without burning other spots for the next days to come. Because you talk a lot about that on your yeah, you, Insta you have story to remember, too. Yeah. Your hunting window for primetime whitetails is 20 days. That's prime time. If you burn spots by passing them, then those spot you can check those you can check those off your map. If you're burning them, moving past them during daylight, or you know if there's if you have to come out at dark and you're passing two food plots, they're going to be loaded with deer. I've always said that each time you hunt a spot, you can count on seeing half of what you saw the time before that. Hmm. So a lot of times, if you set a new stand. After you've hunted it three days, say you saw 30 on the first day, you can see 15 the second, then you'll then you're down to six. You know, it just it just cuts in half, cuts in half, cuts in half. Yeah. So every time you cut a spot in half by moving past it, even though you weren't there sitting on it, a lot of times sitting on it isn't what burns it. It's when they when you have to exit, when you have to come in, or when one looks at you, or one circles the food plot downwind. And then get your scent and then snorts and then everything else clears out. Then you've burned it. And some some of the things just say, well, it could have been a coyote. It could have been whatever. I'm going to go back. But I think the really mature ones, they're just like, you know what? There's other fish in the sea. I've got more places to eat. I don't have to eat there every night. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go over here. What's the, you know, what's the risk? I've been there 25 times this year and I've never experience anything where i had to put my tail up so i'm just going to go over there and i'll come back here in a few weeks i mean that's kind of what they do you know i think and the that's smart what it ones. seems like the you know whitetail hunters do is they may not sit in the stand very long but there are months and months of preparation leading up to that where they can go i'm going to make an educated guess and go there tonight and it's like yeah you sat there for two hours but actually you put you know, it's hundreds may, of may, hours may, for yeah, one may, minute. Maybe even an entire year yeah. it's unseen, into prepping it's, that it's, scenario. Yeah, it's pretty impressive to think about all the time that you guys, like the surgical nature, I would say, that you go in looking for an animal that you would put a name to and like, oh, here we are. Obviously, there's a pattern to that. Yes, I mean, which requires time and goes effort. goes into your field, yeah. correct? I mean, it would be easy to say, okay, here's our target. We know they've been here a few times, and we could go there, and if we're there for – if we're there two weeks, we're going to see him. Yeah. But wait a minute. 
if we're there two weeks, someone's going to know that we were there. Yeah. So how do we go there the one time when the odds are literally stacked completely in our favor? And if it doesn't work out, we probably know we can't go back. What's the, what's the next target point? Yeah. That's how you have to approach it. Otherwise, you're not going to kill something that lives nine years defending its life and is you know they literally live nine years they're as smart as they come yeah and people are trying to kill them all the time and na- nature's trying to do it as well they just i you know i feel like because they live a tenth of our life they educate a tenth faster or 10x but, faster you mean? Yeah, yeah yeah i think they yeah 10x faster so I is mean, there a time of the of the season that has been more productive for you like because I've the biggest deer, whitetail, anyways, that I've ever seen right on the hoof, you know, came by me at 30 yards, trailing a doe, and at a certain point, I just ended up yelling at the thing, trying to get it to stop, <laughs> and it never, it never did know I was there. No, it never did. What yeah. did you yell? I, I, hey. I finally just said, "Hey!" <laughs> you know, you do the erp, awesome. erp, erp, and then elevate, and then you're just like, "Hey!" I think I actually said, "Hey, fucker," because I'm at full draw on it. How fast awesome. was he moving? He was just trailing, but there was he was not slowing down. No, he was not slowing down. And they so, turn like, off all senses when they're on a doe. It's like it's amazing. Tractor beam. It's like I've had when, bear do that too. It's like but. when you have a buddy that has just a real bitch as a girlfriend, and you're like, dude, this chick is a bitch, and he's just like, no what? way, dude. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm going out tonight, and you're like, did you see? She was totally chatting up that other guy last night, and he's just like, I'm going out tonight. <laughs> Dude, she rode four of our friends last week. I'm going out tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's like. Because you want to be the fifth. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, man. We might have gone off the rails here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Survival 101. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to go look at the. All right, Barkley. This one's directly we're for you. We're cooking elk brats and burgers while we're podcasting. And so. here's the deal Barkley loves a brat. Yep, I do. I'll post. <laughs> actually, you know what? That picture's going up no. for this podcast. <laughs> it's not. So here's the first question. Make it a, this make is it a Barklow one. It though. is. Okay, perfect. I just I'm listened leaving. to your first episode with Barklow for the third time. He's a f- obviously a fan. Okay, no Barclow. pressure. Yep. And I had a technical question I was hoping you could either get a direct answer for or include in a future podcast with him. I'm an avid outdoors enthusiast, mostly in the endurance space, and would love recommendation on John's preferred UL synthetic sleep system. I have been using UL down bags for a number of years, and there is such a plethora of gear, not all good, obviously, that when it comes to synthetic sleeping bags, uh, I go a little cross-eyed. Yeah, so... uh... And this is a good one because a lot of people focus on the camo, and if you're going to do an extended hunt, there's some things you should think about. Shelter being one of them, we can maybe tackle that later, but this is what you'd be sleeping in inside of your shelter. I think we touched a little bit on sleeping bags. Maybe. In yeah. uh, in Lanai. It's hard to remember that, Andy. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> but take it away because this is your wheelhouse for sure. I know you think about this stuff often. Yeah, I do. So, you know, I'm, I'm on record as um, talking a lot of good about synthetics. Mm-hmm. And what I like to say, though, is that I'm not – I'm not anti-down, I'm just pro-synthetic, right? So there's, there's a difference kind of in mind space the way you look at that. But um, the thing I like about synthetics is they dry really quick. Yep. Uh, and which I think is part of people's problem with synthetics is that they do dry quick, especially with a base layer, that you almost feel like heat's being pulled away from your body, which in some regard, it, you know, it, it might be, but You're it's such about a in the drying process. Yeah, but it's such a short period of time that, um, you know, five, ten, fifteen minutes, depending, right? Yeah. Whereas when you wear wool, and and uh, you know, wool's a great product. Really, synthetic is all it's trying to do in, in a lot of regard is trying to mimic wool, but but wool stays wet longer. Yep. And so you know, you've been there. You kind of get that kind of steamy, clammy feeling. But in that process, um, you're relatively warm, right? So, so wool dries, takes longer to dry, but it's, it, it, it just feels keeps, damp forever. Right, but it keeps some, some heat-retaining properties where synthetic dries very quick, mm-hmm. um, which is really what I'm after. And so I think if you know how to layer. So when you start talking about sleeping bags, and I'm a big proponent of sleeping in my clothing, so I've invested all this 
uh, time and money in building a clothing system. Uh, why would I want to take it off and sleep in my underwear at night? So the, the, the old wives' tale is, well, you're warmer if you sleep, you know, in your sleeping bag in your underwear. Well, that's not true. I mean, just... It is it, true if you're with another man. Well, that aside, <laughs> or if you're under a quilt. Okay. Um, but, uh, but, you know, especially if you have any kind of moisture in your system, get in a sleeping bag and dry it out. And so when you wake up in the morning, you, you, so if, you know, just for ease of sake... Uh, for management, I already have my clothes on. I can get up. I can go take a whiz in the middle of the night, or I can get up and go hunt, whatever. If I'm wet, um, every layer I have is already dry, but you have to consider the sleeping bag you get in. So if you get in a traditional down bag, as that moisture moves through the system, it's going to begin to clump those those down feathers, right? Yeah. Um, you, as a human being, just when you're sleeping, you put off moisture, so that moisture is going to be in the bag no matter what. Then you put any moisture in the system, there's more moisture. If you go with a... Uh, and for people who uh, don't understand why there is condensation inside of their tent that's, when they wake up in the so morning. So that, that, that is the physical ra- uh, manifestation of that moisture from you. Yeah, coming out through your pores and then the and aspiration. Your, and your all, clothing, yeah. yep. Yep. which really at that point you need to ventilate your... Uh, sleeping bag or a tent better the the treated downs are good the the problem with treated downs is it almost lures people into a false sense of security so what they do is they take the feathers and they treat them kind of with a water repellent treatment the problem with that is that and i've you know me personally and in my former career like i did extensive testing in that at a certain point those down feathers will be overtaken by moisture but more importantly, you know, they always show like a, um, uh, a cup of water and then the feathers float on top of the water and then they shake it and they're like, look, it's, it's still waterproof. The, the problem with the actual uh, real application of that is if I have a sleeping bag with treated down and I get in and I'm damp, anywhere there's a compression area. So if I put an elbow down, if I lay on my back, yep. if there's enough moisture those feathers will become compromised. Which is going to be half of your bag because it's impossible to lay in a bag without a compression area. Correct. With, with compression, it's been my experience that once those treated down feathers are wet, it takes just as long to dry as a traditional down bag. So, you know, maybe I'm a bit of a simpleton, but I want to go into the mountains with a system that's as durable as possible. I want to make myself as durable as possible. I want to make my system, whatever that is, as durable as possible. So I think you can get uh, a synthetic bag where I sleep in my clothes. Because I'm sleeping in my clothes and I understand that, I can choose a bag that's lighter. Mm -hmm. So I can get away with a 30-degree bag, for instance, wearing my clothes in zero-degree weather. So I was going to ask you that when we get to the end of this. Not necessarily a brand uh, just so you don't have to nail anything down. But yeah. if you personally were to design a bag that would have the largest sweet spot, what temperature rating would you design it for? So I've, you know, I've been able to wear or use, I guess I should say, um, I, my, my favorite is a 30 degree bag, mm-hmm. but there's a lot to that, right? So it's, it's my body mass. It's my, uh, it's my, um, you know, how good a shape I'm in, it's, it's my diet, it's what I'm eating, it's how hydrated I'm in. So there's a lot of physiology involved. But I would say somewhere between a 20 and 30 degree bag, if you utilize your clothing system and you have a good ground pad, so it, the, the ground pad cannot be overstated. Like yeah. you can't just lay the sleeping bag down on the ground and expect it to do something. Well, you can. You can expect it to suck. It's going to suck. <laughs> there, there's no doubt. So well, explain the role it, of the it, ground so pad. Do me, uh not to cut you off, but so explain two things. Explain the role of the ground pad and then the, also the rating system on a sleeping bag. When you say a 30-degree bag, what does that mean? Start there and then explain the role of the ground pad. Yeah, so sleeping bags are rated. You know, any good sleeping bag is, is there's a like a European standard. It's called the EN standard. Um, I think it's called the ISO standard now. But, but basically, the, you know, they put a mannequin uh, in the bag, a copper mannequin in the bag, and it's got sensors, and they come up with this rating. And it's like... There's a, and I'll probably get this wrong, but there's, there's three ratings. There's the rating where you're going to live, but you're probably going to wish you didn't. <laughs> um, 
there's the rating where, you know, you're going to be so warm that, you know, the average human of whatever body fat's going to be like super warm. And then there's kind of the middle. So I think that's called the comfort rating. And I should know these better, but, but there's three ratings. And so generally speaking, most people default to the, to the middle rating, the comfort rating. Yep. So that's like an average human being. Um, and it's not, it's not as big as me, right? So five, nine or five, 10, whatever, um, with average body mass, um, can lay in this bag with no clothes on and be comfortable at, you know, 30 degrees, but you know, none of us want to be average and I comfortable at 30 degrees. You mean outside temperature? Correct. Ambient. Yep. So if you go inside a sleep, uh, if you put yourself inside a tent, it's going to be warmer in the tent than it is outside. Right. Hopefully. And, and it could be anywhere on average from five to 10 degrees difference. So that immediately bumps that sleeping bag up to a warmer rating. Yep. Now you sleep in your clothes that bumps it up to yet a warmer rating then if you're well hydrated, at least for the back country, and eat a decent meal with enough protein and fat so your metabolism is burning all night, that bumps it up yet again. And I've been able to, and I don't necessarily, you know, I don't want to condone this without the proper training, but I was able to work for the last 10 years of my life in any mountain range I went to in the middle of winter with a 30-degree sleeping bag. And I never felt that my sleep was compromised or yeah. that I was in fear of my life. But I also knew what I was doing. You were managing all those other things you talked about. So that's what it's a system. You cannot look at any single component in isolation. Everything must be looked at as a complete system working in, you know, some kind of uh, synchronicity to, to produce this end result. And so what people do is they're like, oh, I love this bag because it's down and it's super lightweight and compressible. And I love this jacket and I love this ground pad. It's like, yes, but at some point they have to come together and work as a system. And if the first time you're doing that is say, you know, a hunt on Kodiak in March, like you may be really, really disappointed with the results, right? <laughs> and you may blame it on the gear. You may, you, you may begin to blame it then on yeah. any single component, my tent, my sleeping bag, my ground pad. What the ground pad does to get back to your point is you need to insulate yourself from the ground to prevent conductive heat loss so the you know your body's 98.6 the ground is not so the ground is going to immediately start to suck heat away from yep. your body it's like a magnet into the ground it's like a magnet right it, it wants to seek some kind of stasis um, so you need to insulate yourself from the ground so you can do that with either a closed cell foam uh, pad right which is good mm -hmm. um, and they're lightweight and they're durable and there's lots of good things about that but the R value, and I couldn't quote them off the top of my head, you know, is, is, is okay. Or you can go with an inflatable ground pad. So that, you, that's the one you inflate with your breath or, you know, or some kind of bag. And you can put an inch plus of, you know, air in. So this dead air is a great insulator. It gets you off the ground. And so, you know, in the middle of winter, I use a slightly different ground pad than I do in summer, right? So if we're going to go on this elk hunt, I may run a, a half to three quarter inch. If I'm going out in the middle of winter, I may run inch, inch and a half ground pad. But but that, it all has to be factored in. And I think an uh, important to work point is in there, unison. regardless of summer or winter, you're still putting something in between you and the ground to you manage can, that. You can never sit your ass on the ground. So if you're in a survival situation... And, you know, you don't have a ground pad and you're going to sit down and, and ride a night out sitting around the fire. If you're not sitting on, you know, pine bows or vegetation or something to get your butt off the ground, the, the, the earth is literally going to be sucking the heat out of your ass. Like, you, you, it, it's critical. Like, I think if I had to lay there in my clothes um, and lay on the ground, or lay, uh, so lay on the ground in a, in a lightweight sleeping bag without a ground pad or lay on the ground pad in my clothes without a sleeping bag, I would rather lay on the ground pad in my clothes on the ground because I, I've just learned if I can get out of the wind, like that is going to be a better indicator of, of keeping me warm yep. than, than just trying to wrap yourself up in this blanket, right? So I don't know. That's There's a lot to it. And, and honestly, in a, I mean, you could do a, Quite frankly, you could do an hour podcast just on that question. You could do but, three hours on a sleeping but, bag. But so yeah. when, when, it, when it comes, you know, and, and I also don't think that any one sleeping bag is like, 
you, I don't own one sleeping bag. I mean, right there in the corner is three, right? And I got a plenty more. But, <laughs> you know, you kind of have to pick the right tool for the job. Yep. But I also have enough experience that, that I've come to kind of settle on certain things. And synthetic sleeping bags, to me, um, kind of make the most sense for most of the time. If you and I are going to go climb Everest, yeah, we'll probably wear down, right? And we'll probably bring down. But completely different environment completely different and fortunately we're not going to do that we're not going to do that i hope yeah as an aside i actually had in my uh i had in my will when i was active duty that if i got killed (laughs) i wanted uh five people to summit everest without oxygen with my ashes in the hopes that they would all die (laughs) just to be an (laughs) asshole i mean (laughs) i kid you not i actually hand wrote that oh no i don't doubt that actually (laughs) yeah all right. I have something written for my death, but yeah, you'll pre- both of you probably be involved with it. Yeah, but well, you, your, your death you. or the uh, or the actual yeah, celebration which, thereafter. I'll be gone before both. both of you. Don't sweat it. So okay. you guys can deal with that. All right, this one is for uh, Dudley. Even though I've answered this question before, but you I guys won't. need to try that while I'm answering this. I will. Dudley, while Barclay was discussing at a very deep level his knowledge of sleeping bags. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dudley was cooking, it looks like, sausage and hamburgers. It's elk. So elk I've, brats and elk hamburger. So I've answered this one from uh, a rifle perspective, from a perspective of long-range marksmanship, but I think this comes from a, an archer, so I'd rather have you answer it. It says, I have a question, but small background. I just picked up archery in some part due to you as well as other sources. I do shoot guns, and from my mental aspect, I try to be very mindful of pulling the trigger as to point of not being surprised by it, which I have an issue with that Mm -hmm. over distance. So from your sniper training, I think you do the same. Incorrect. Uh, Surprise break is incredibly important. The question is, do you carry that to your bow? I have seen John Dudley and a few others say that you want to be surprised, but I am finding that hard to overcome. If you have time, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Thanks again. Yeah, that's the uh, that's same as Barklow with the sleeping bag. This could almost be a podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's – I was actually really enjoying the fact that um, I got to work with you and Trevor Thompson, mutual friend, um, who we were – at during that time, we were all able to start to make some correlation between. And if he's been a podcast listener, he probably heard some of that, which is good. But there's a lot of people that want to know when the shot is happening. With archery, I feel like that anticipation isn't good. Which um, is the same with the rifle, which is why I said okay, I, don't, yeah. I don't try to say and now. Mm-hmm. Because then you get people who are flinching or anticipating or tightening up. And I don't know, maybe if you're at the highest level, you're going to know every time. But I was taught to slowly and smoothly up, apply the pressure. It's not like, oh, my God, it mm-hmm. went off. Yeah. I know when it's about to go off, kind of. Yeah. But I'm not trying to anticipate that break. Yeah. Well, especially when you're involving, this is one of the things that's tough for people with archery is the first thing they're given by most archery shops is a wrist strap release. Yep. That has, um, that's activated from your index finger. And the, the thing is your index finger is probably the most, sensitive phalange you have it, it's arguably the most sensitive sensitive thing you have to actual touch and understanding of pressure and travel and movement because your fingers do a lot more things than other parts of your body that are sensitive i mean obviously you pinch someone in the back of the tricep it hurts but your tricep probably doesn't understand you know pressure and things like that whereas the finger really especially the index finger really knows tenths of a pound fractions of a pound as it builds and yeah when i'm shooting a rifle with especially with a two-stage trigger i know when i've cleared stage one anything after that it's party time it's party time (laughs) right so um the main thing is letting that float happen without trying to clinch other muscles that are going to cause you to veer off target as you compress the trigger for that final piece with archery what you have to realize is an arrow clearing the power stroke of a bow is not happening at 2200 feet per second yeah i mean it is happening at 300 feet per second or less so i mean you could imagine 
um, you know, trying to, um, if you have a spitball gun and you're, you know, and you're trying to like flinch and, and do that thing, it takes so long for that to clear that straw. And that's what's happening with archery. When you anticipate or you flinch, or if you're thinking that you're going to move past the target and make it happen at the same time, it's not literally coming out of the barrel and, and breaking the sound barrier and hitting the target. It is a casting object. It's like throwing a rock. I mean, if someone was if someone was running by you and you had your arm cocked back and they ran straight past the front of you and then you threw the rock, you're going to miss them. And that's like a very slowed down version of what's happening when people try to anticipate the trigger with archery equipment. And um, there was recently a really big professional tournament where one of the people that were leading it um, was obviously from some of the video that I was watching, he was anticipating his trigger and making it happen. He had an amazing first several targets in a first few days, but then all of a sudden, all you know everything catches up to him and the wheels come off and that's what you and and the problem is the wheels come off with when you're anticipating stuff it means that you have you're not able to control a certain stress factor yeah and when that stress factor gets elevated then obviously your ability to control that is going to be elevated at the same time and it's not a good combination to be in what you need to do is you, you have to be willing to let that part go and try to get that surprise shot to where that that fine line of I don't really like that feeling or I'm not really good at doing it that way and I can do it better this way when I'm doing it right I can do it better this way you're right if I punch the trigger I can tell you right now I could light some people's ass up for a day and then well and up close too uh, yeah yeah I mean if I want to go out and punch the trigger for a day you know Good luck, everybody. <laughs> but if anyone's smart, come back in a week because yeah. I'm going to be, you know, watching YouTube videos on how to get rid of the shanks because that's that's what's going to happen. It'll happen to anybody. So you know um, how we used to catch that with rifles, and it's it's invisible because a lot of people will focus just on the end result. All you have to do to catch somebody with a rifle or a pistol is to throw a dummy mm -hmm. round in their magazine, and you don't tell them. And this is what I, uh, I remember to this day, probably two decades ago, two and a half, I was teaching my sister how to shoot a pistol. And she didn't know anything about it, so I sent the slide forward first, and I put the magazine in. She thinks it's hot. I know damn well when she pulls the trigger, <laughs> yeah. nothing's going to happen. So she presents the way that I told her to. You know, she's balanced, she's braced, she's going out, she's got about an 80-20 left-hand grip, right-hand grip, and, and she would have <laughs> shot the table in front of her. Now... If a round had gone off when she pulled the trigger, I probably would have seen some of it because it was so gross, but mm -hmm. a lot of it would have been hidden by the recoil. Yep. And it it exposes instantaneously the fundamentals. And it, I used to do it all the time. Like, believe me, I've punched some triggers with the trigger on a rifle. Man, I've thrown some dummy rounds in. It's like, wow, I'm glad I didn't just <laughs> shoot the ground three feet in front of me because the it. And if you don't yeah. focus on those things, yeah, because the target was seven feet in front of me. Yep. I can do – I could – close my eyes mm -hmm. and hit the target. I could put it between my legs and hit the, it doesn't matter. Yep. But if you put that at 300 yards yeah. or oh, 1,500 yards and you pull that same bullshit. Or slow the bullet down. Yeah. Are you less accurate when you shoot subsonic? I wouldn't say that you're, I mean. you. Are your mistakes magnified if you're subsonic? I would say that the round has more time to be impacted by the environment. If you have good fundamentals, so supersonic. in a way it's similar, I guess. Yeah, but. supersonic versus subsonic. If you have the same fundamentals and let's say you have a smooth, everything, your shooting fundamentals are good, and I'd say you have a, a, a clean break of the trigger, I'd say the only thing that's going to get you is the time in flight. But say you're flinching. Oh, it's going to be worse, subsonic. Oh, so that's the same thing. So, I mean, subsonic to, to supersonic is, that's a pretty small window. But the window between subsonic to archery is like freaking yeah. jumping your the Millennium Falcon yeah. into <laughs> freaking hyperspace versus just yeah. cruising around with the you know with the other things. Yeah, speed of sound is still pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. I think I think people have to overcome that. And all of us sitting here, all shoot a release that I'm an advocate of. We keep hearing it over and over and over again. Um, called the Silverback, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to lie. It's, 
it, you know, it'd be a lot like taking a person that has extreme target panic with a pistol and all they're doing is shooting dummy rounds or shooting a trigger that the only way it will fire is if they slowly squeeze it and then it will fire. Like if you made a pistol trigger or a rifle trigger that was like that, imagine how many elite level military snipers would you would all of a sudden say, holy shit, this guy can't even get this trigger to go off because he's... He's wanting to brace and he's wanting it to yep. hit that trigger. This identifies those problems. And when people, I've had a lot of people that, that buy it. And at first they'll send a thing saying it's not working right. And then I'll, you know, it's hard because there's, there's so many going out that I just, you know, I need to clone myself just to talk to everyone that buys <laughs> a silverback <laughs> because the people that I can reach out to and say, okay, Hey, you know, let me, let me look at a few things. And I have a program on my phone called Dartfish. So I'll actually download videos of people and then run it through this program called Dartfish where it slows things down a lot for me. And then I can actually see these instantaneous fragments of a second where I can I can understand that they're actually, they're anticipating the shot and they're convinced I am not. And it's like, okay, you see this second right here where you're like and going forward, coming back, your eyes are squeezing tight. I was going to say the eyes closed is a classic one with the gun. They're just like, <laughs> I saw it go off. And then you take the picture. Like, you yeah. didn't see shit? <laughs> yeah, it's the same. It's the same. But, hey, we've all been there. Um, the main thing is I don't. I'm not the right person to ask the correlation between the two, which is, which is why I really – want to get training from trevor on the tactical side i think even though i'm not a philosophy i'm not a gun guy but i think that would help me yeah well it would help me bridge it's the same thing so when i answer this guy's question it it i tried to explain it's not surprise like oh wow i didn't know that was going to happen it is it's slowly in control i don't know exactly when it's going to happen but i'm in control of when it goes off like today when we're sitting down here shooting i one thing I think people watching you shoot, they think that your pin is probably rock solid, steady, exactly where your arrow is going to hit. Mm -hmm. I can tell you right now, from my perspective, that's not what my sight picture looks yeah, like. Not mine either. It's uh, Maybe it's on the target. Maybe it's not. But once I commit to slowly pulling through that, all I'm thinking about is pulling. And I look through the pin and try to look at where I want it to hit to let the subconscious take over, which mm -hmm. I'm stealing from you. But it's not... If you get into the habit of it looks great right now, if you think that with a rifle, you're screwed. It yeah. looks good right now. If you're telling yourself that in your head, you're setting yourself up for failure later in whatever it is that you're doing. Yeah, there's times where it certainly looks like I have this, I have a, um, I guess a margin. I have a, a tolerance level. There's times where it's like, okay, it looks okay. It doesn't look great. Or, okay, this is not good. You know, when there's times where my pin isn't even on the target, <laughs> you know, I need to let off the gas because this is just like this. If the wind's completely blown me off the target, I'm this is not going to go the direction I want at all. So there is a fine line, but there's also within that kill zone, if I'm floating around within that whole kill zone, um, and a lot of times, like, you know, it's all proportional. So if I'm shooting an indoor round, which the indoor round, the X ring, which I'm trying to hit is about the size of a dime or a little smaller. But then there's a 10 ring around the X, which is about the size of a quarter. So if I'm floating within that quarter, I'm happy with knowing I'm going to hit the X. And then obviously when I go back to 100 yards, if I'm, if I'm floating within that entire gold or some red, yeah then I'm okay with that. Now, if I'm hitting blue and black, obviously it's like I need to get myself back in the middle. You know, and if there's elements like wind forcing me off, I have to get myself back on. But you have to get to the point where you're okay with that. And once you're okay with that, you, you're you making a big step as an archer. There's two different levels. There, or a shooter in general, too. Yeah, rifle, pistol. Yeah. There's So there's one... There's one step where you're just okay with knowing your pins going off and pulling through. And a lot of people that'll still happen, but they'll you'll also see them still blink after like the release will break and then they'll blink, but it's an after reaction. 
But then once you get beyond that of like really getting to the point where it's like, I'm totally okay with, you know, it's probably like people having a gun go off around them. Once you're, once you've heard it enough times, you don't start blinking every time you hear it go off. And it's the same thing. There's a, there's a small window of people start to let their shot break and then they're blinking and then they get to the point where it's breaking and they're not feeling that, that reaction. So I think he just needs to stick with it and don't use the crutch. A lot of people, a lot of people want to use what they were taught tactically, especially people that were tactical prior moving into the archery world. They want to use that as a crutch. Don't use it as a crutch. I don't know if it's a hundred percent the way you I mean you're saying it's not how you're trained. I wouldn't know. I just know don't use this as a crutch. I'm just telling you if I have 10 guys and I teach and nine of them tackle the way that I'm saying, those nine are going to be good. The one guy that wants to stick, there might be one guy every now and then that can stick to his method and he just does good that way because he always has. Yep. But that's the anomaly. And I always say, I don't, I try to play the odds. Yeah, you might I don't play want, towards the norm. Yeah. I don't want to be the <laughs> anomaly. I want to be the, I want to be the, I want to be in the favor of, you know, the majority of the people that just need what's best for the masses. That, that, that's where I fall in. I really feel like I'm average. I mean, I feel like I'm an average guy that strives to work towards the average way of being the best. I don't know if that's a good way to put it, but I'm an average person that just, I'm, I'm, I want to perfect the average way of doing it. And I think it works for the majority of people and it's worked for me, you know, Work that's what me. I think. Got anything right. to add? John Barklow? JB? No. <laughs> How is – what did you like best? Did you like the – well, of course, the prod. <laughs> yeah. Dude, you wore that I think, out. I don't even know if he chewed, but – Your wife took half your <laughs> elk burger. No, that's awesome. All right, here's a good one for both of you. Uh-oh. What resources could I read slash study that John, both of you, Johns, might recommend? What would be in his first aid kit – how much is too much? And I like this part of the question. Oh, God. At what juncture would you or John hit the oh shit button on your in reach <laughs> instead of dealing it with yourself? So here's a question. Do oh, you. God. That was 14 questions. Well, let's go backwards. So the in reach, um, and, you know, it is 2018. There's a bunch of devices you can hook up to your cell phone that have satellite connectivity. Do you roll Barklow in the field with an in reach? I have not in the past. All and, right, that's and, all you get to answer. And this year, <laughs> but but uh, I put my wife to through too much uh, through too much stuff, and uh, so this year I am yeah. okay. But I've had satellite phones in the past. Yep. How about you, Dud? Do you ever roll with uh, non cell phone coverage type stuff? Satellite. Well, here here's the th- this is kind of a loaded question because when you have family and when you have a wife at home and when a lot of the world knows when you aren't there that's a different whole different subject for sure so but i normally travel everywhere with the sat phone do i pick it up and call call on it all the time i don't yep and 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 actually barklow and i both need to be spanked because this past year when we went to bc i mean a lot of people followed the story it was a it was a very fun hunt and a cool hunt and which is what all of us, I mean, the three of us and Trevor included, we're all after an adventure each time. And we like to kind of push that envelope. But we were all under the understanding that there was Wi-Fi in camp, like an actual satellite up on a big pole to where it could reach out. So I didn't bring my sat phone and John didn't either. And we literally got there and lightning and hit the damn pole and the freaking <laughs> yeah. Wi-Fi was down. So, I mean, I think I had to go like 20, was it 20 or 30 K yeah, it wasn't, just it wasn't to find a, a 10 foot radius that gave a signal. a signal. So it was one of those things where you were trying to, to reach out. I've, n- I've never had to reach out like on a true oh shit button. Yeah. My reach out has always been for just for the, for family situations. But both of you guys would advocate having the ability to reach out at any A hundred percent. Yeah. Here's absolutely. the other thing too. This is actually very, very important for whitetail hunters because I really think that whitetail hunting is actually more dangerous than Western hunting. Um, because the amount of people that are injured falling from a tree stand 
far surpass the amount of people that I know that get attacked by a wolf or attacked by a grizzly bear. So here's my protocol. Um, I actually have a map of the farms that I have. Each of my stands are numbered. So when I go to a stand, my game warden and my wife are on a group text and they both get text. I'm at 37. And for me, I, I actually, this is, this is another kind of a weird subject for some people, the game warden thing. Um, I've just got to the point where, yeah, the first few times you tell your game warden where you're going to be, he's probably going to be there. <laughs> but, you know, six years later, he's like, uh, okay, <laughs> I have other bigger fish to fry. Um, I personally, especially with what I do, I feel like that's a, that plays into my favor. One, for safety. Two, for the fact of just because of what I do, it's so easy for people to say, you know, oh, well, you did it, you know, he didn't do it legally or, you know, that deer was five miles this way. You know, the buck that I shot, people could have easily said, you know, that buck was on my property three miles over here. You know, if I don't, if I'm never covering anything up, one, I don't have anything to hide, which I think is good on a different level. But on the same thing, um, I have a podcast that if you haven't listened to the podcast that I did with my Uncle Kenny, which I don't know the number, I can look it up, you need to listen to that podcast because even though it wasn't a hunting fall from a tree, it was an instance where he got seriously injured um, on a tractor. On a tractor. And no one knew where he was, um, and he almost died because of that. Whereas, um, so Sharon has fallen from a tree. Um, she fell one time in Alberta. She fell 20 foot um, onto her back. And, Damn. And luckily, it was we were in a pine tree, and the hole underneath the pine tree was all um, pine needles, and it was raining. It had rained for days. So when she hit, I think because she's light, nothing happened. Um, but it was literally we, w I went up the tree first, got in, hooked a tether on the tree stand, was sitting there with the carabiner in my hand. And I told her to climb up, hold on tight. She literally got to the last peg and I grabbed her safety, you know, the extension. The rope, yep. Yeah. I had grabbed the har the line off the top of her harness and I turned away from her to, and I grabbed the carabiner and I was literally moving to clip the two on and then her safety belt just pulled right out of my hand and I look and here's my wife just falling, you Oof, know, and it damn. is the worst feeling. For sure, helpless. Because I thought, you know, here's my, my wife's going to be crippled and I was literally holding onto her line, you know, it's like, and luckily she was okay. And then fast forward a year later, I had a tree peg break on me when I was transitioning from my tree stand, from my peg onto my stand. And I had, I literally had my carabiner and was trying to clip them and it broke and I fell about 20 feet onto my back. And when I did that, um, it was the first day I'd ever taken a heater bodysuit out with me and I had it strap bungeed to the back of my backpack. And when I landed, I landed on that heater bodysuit that's equivalent to a big ass sleeping bag so i just literally racked my back and i ended up getting um i ended up rupturing one of my kidneys i had a renal infarct in my kidney i went in the hospital for seven days it was like 50 grand one of my kidneys doesn't work um by the way and it was a bad deal so yeah i mean those protocols for texting my game warden and sharon because the reality is your wife needs to know where you are um, the other reality is she's probably not going to know how to go to that spot. Your game warden's going to know yeah. how to go to that spot. So, you know, and it, if it's not your game warden, it should be your best buddy. I mean, if the three of us lived here and we were all <coughs> elk oh, hunters, sure. I would just be like, guys, I'm going to the Spanish Peaks tonight. I'm going to be in this basin. Mm -hmm. And you have to because if you don't show up, it doesn't – that's a that's a better oh shit button than you have in a satellite phone because the problem is if you fall and you're unconscious or, you know, and I've found this a lot as well um, as a fireman, people that get in, in like vehicle accidents, they can't get to their cell phone because they don't know where the hell it is. Yeah. When your cell phone's well, ejected out of the yeah, car. when your cell phone's in your cup holder and you go rolling down the road um, ten times up and over, you know, ass over tea kettle – 
you can't grab your cell phone to call. If you're down in a ditch, that's how a lot of the people that end up dying is because no one knows they're down there. It's the same thing. The oh yeah. shit button for hunting is letting people know where you are. That's the number one. I would add yeah. to that a drop dead time. If you don't hear from me by, you know, something's happened. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know any of that. But, you know, to go back to the uh, first aid kit. Cause well, I hold think on. I'm gonna, we're going to work our way backwards. Well, if I you was... did have a drop dead button. And you were in the back country, like let's say you're back in Kodiak. What did you teach the guys for reaching out to the next higher level of care? When was the criteria to hit, I need help? Yeah, so that goes back to what your training is and yep. what you carry into the field, okay. right? So, God damn you. Just talk about the first aid kit. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I know how to segue. <laughs> but, you know, having been through, you know, wilderness EMT, and you know combat casualty care that we got in the military and and all that like you can the worst guy to ask a shortcut you you have (laughs) those skills though you you have those skills but the reality is you know even with our great corpsmen like what are they going to do they're going to stabilize and call for a medevac right that that that's what you do you're not going to try to suture somebody in the field you're not going to try to intubate somebody or give them a crike you know i mean yeah, I, I, I mean, if I was gun hunting, which I don't do anymore, I would. I might carry a, a tourniquet, but the reality is, I know what a tourniquet does. Mm-hmm. I know how it works. I can improvise a tourniquet from almost anything, and so to not carry too much stuff, and, and you know, kind of the what if, and and you could what if it and worry yourself to death, and at For that sure. point, maybe you shouldn't go anywhere. But I, I carry the basics, and then at at a certain point, I need to be able right? The SOS button, the sat phone, I need to be able to know who to call. So for instance, if I call, you know, Julie and I'm like, Hey, like when we were in Kodiak, I'm like, Hey, you know, spin the SAR bird up from the coast guard. If she doesn't have the number to SAR, cause I haven't left it there. Or if I don't have it with me. So, you know, with my sat phone, I had all the critical numbers I needed to call. So it's like, Oh, I need a, I need a helicopter. I need it over my head right now dude done but i'm not going to try to carry my buddy out over the my shoulder you know i'm going to call for help or how are they going to make a movie out of that or if the weather's bad enough if you don't carry him over your shoulder yeah well i want to see you carry me (laughs) we would just quarter you up and carry you out (laughs) exactly only option eight feet tall (laughs) but you know the other thing is can you just stabilize somebody and make them feel relatively comfortable yeah you know can can you can you stop bleeding can you you know keep an airway um those are the two biggest ones. And then can you somehow mitigate some of their pain? I think if you stuff Other a blue chew you in ha- the wound, it'll swell up and, it could. Cl- and clot it. You could probably <laughs> use blue chew for altitude. But. Well, you could but be you able know, to do you, both. So you could stabilize and call for higher level care at the same time if you have those resources Absolutely, available. you should be. Yep. But, but to, you know, so I, I have gotten some people out of the mountains that have had, uh, you know, altitude sickness and, and probably trending to pulmonary edema. But most of the time they were ambulatory. But when they started to go down and I literally, you know, I couldn't drag them or carry them out, yep. you're going you're gonna to hurt them, yeah, right? You, you, at that point, you need to call for a higher level of care. And so you have to have the capacity to do that. But to sit there and go, I'm going to bring a sled and I'm going to do this. And I got, I, I just think it's a bit much, yep. especially, especially if you don't have the care. So I'm not going to sew somebody up in the field. To include myself, I have cut myself really bad couple times with uh, broadheads and some of the different <laughs> scalpel knives that I've got this and what do I do I know off. I know how to put compression yeah. or uh, you know compression on. I know how to stop the bleeding I know how to just take care of that and I get myself out of the field you know yeah I think um, the key point in that is not pushing it once you realize you need to get the hell out of there I, I don't think you should push it especially if there's two of you the best thing you know it's no different than if you're in a plane and they say okay if we're going you know if if we're losing altitude and the oxygen mask come in, put it on the child first because the parent has to be the one that actually has the brains in the matter. It, I think if both people, if you're trying to be the hero and pull that person out when you have the ability to contact help, you're going to wear yourself down to the point where you yep. might go into a panic mode or a fight or flight mode. And at that point, most people aren't going to be thinking straight. So you're not doing any good for either, either of the two. I mean, if you have the ability to to make good decisions and make contact, make them while you're making good decisions. 
I mean, that's what, yeah, that's no, what I, I would think. I, I think that's I think that's good advice. So you know, my my first aid kit, for instance, is is pretty pretty basic, pretty small, pretty rudimentary. Yeah. I mean, I've got some good skills, but you know, I don't practice them all the time. They're perishable, but I have the ability to communicate with people who actually have the skills and can get that person out of the field. You know, I've I've got you know a couple stories, and I mean, it's it's been touch and go. You know, even when the person's ambulatory but hurting real bad and they're bleeding and we've you know got it to to stop like they're they're not hitting on all cylinders and you're trying to get this person out and you can get yourself in some situations and you're like you know what maybe we just need to stay kind of right where we are and have somebody come to us yeah so yeah don't try to be the hero if you see something trending in the wrong direction just accept the trend and go with it yeah but you are the hero if you can like manage that situation and get somebody to help you like that's that's managing the situation but Barclay, they don't make movies about that. No, they they won't make. Damn a movie it! About Just that. remember, most movies that were made are from a catastrophe, and somebody probably died. So don't be Multiple that person. <laughs> normally, yeah. Yeah, just avoid the movie. All right, water purifiers. Which ones do you prefer? Which ones should you stay away from? And just be broad. You don't have to go brand specific if you don't want to. Yep. Do you even carry a water purifier? Dave? I've got a blue straw. I don't it's even like know a life the... straw. Yeah, it's a life straw. Explain That's what that I... is. So literally. A straw with a little reservoir on the end that I'm assuming is the water filter. Yeah. I mean, I don't – the last time I was in situations where I was really back for a long enough period of time to where I had to pack that stuff, I mainly packed purifier tablets and that blue straw because both were super light and that was it. So I'm probably not the best person to ask. So if you're going in the backcountry, you have to figure out – how you're going to uh, filter your water, right? And, I mean, I'm not going to tell you I do it all the time. I, I, I rarely did it in Alaska just because I kind of felt I didn't need to. But, you know, I don't recommend that for people, certainly in the lower 48. There, there's, there's actually a lot of uh, misinformation out there, and I don't think people do it on purpose. But I think that they don't necessarily understand everything that they're trying to to uh to accomplish right so the the biggest thing with when you ask people about filtering water what what's the biggest thing the biggest thing is jardia right that's what they they hear these uh i believe they're cysts right and so you want to get that out of the water the reality is you're probably not going to be hit with jardia when you're in the field because i think it's like a seven to ten day gestation period so, so most, be, yeah, be most of the people are out of the field right but nonetheless the the so there's the two best courses of action are you can either boil the water, which requires fuel, which means you have to carry more fuel. And in the middle of summer, nobody wants to drink hot water, so then you have to let it cool. <laughs> so for the most part, that's not, that's not super uh, uh, effective. And the next one is having some kind of uh, pump. And so the pump is small enough, and there's different kinds of filters, but, you know, ceramics a real good one. And you can pump your water, and the water that comes, you say, out of the stream – into the bottle is clean you can drink it immediately like you can filter it drink it filter it drink it and what that's going to do is it's going to take giardia out and it's also going to take any of the uh silt and and things like that that make the water turbid right to, yep. that, that make it look brown so you're not drinking a bunch of algae and things like that and, and yeah it might require some back flushing but for the most part it's a great great tool when you start to get into cold weather there's some there's some side effects with that. So ceramic filters, even if you pump them all the way dry, they can still have uh, residual water and they can crack. And you might not know it, and you know you may. Yeah, you're not actually filtering what you think you are. Correct. So so there's that, and there's boiling, and then the other one is people say, well, I'm just going to use tabs. It's like, okay, great. Well, read most of those tabs, and when you read the tabs, there's a sitting period. There, there's a exactly right. So you, 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 and it's and it's based off a lot of things. It's based off the turbidity of the water. It's based off the temperature. Well, you know what? You're not going to fucking deal with any of that. <laughs> so you're going to dip, dip your Nalgene bottle in in the water, and if there's any floaties floating around, they're still going to be in the water because you haven't filtered it. And then you're going to drop a tab in, okay? And then that tab has to sit for, if you want to be safe, it's got to sit for four hours. So you're going to have all this water. You can't drink it for four hours. You need to make sure that all the the uh, 
you know, the, the cap and all the threads and everything are treated because it's been touching the, quote, contaminated water. And then you have to wait four hours and then you can drink it. So it's good. And I always carry tabs in case I get myself in a situation where I need to use them. Yeah. But again, to, for my way of thinking is not the most efficient uh, method of water uh, filtration. So now they've got, um, you know, different brands have these big three liter bladders and they've got a bladder with a hose and it filters through one of these uh, ceramic type filters and then it goes into another three liter reservoir. So you literally just scoop up three liters, hold it up or hang it up. It filters three liters into another three liter bladder and you're good to go. Yep. And you can back flush them and all this kind of stuff. So I, I think for the most part, and there's all kinds of uh, different pumps and stuff. I think for the most part that uh, most people, if they're going to the back country, should have some kind of water pump. Yeah. And then back yourself up by either having, um, uh, you know, tabs or something. The other one's a SteriPen. So I was going to ask you, what do you think about so, the UV pens? So I, I, I think they work great. But, again, um, they're lightweight. They work. They're effective. But if you have floaties in the water. So if I'm going to the high country and the water source I'm going to get is, you know, this pure, you know, uh, high, spring mountain, water high anyway. mountain stream. Like, you're really not going to worry about that. But so it really kind of – and I may – I, I've got a, a whole bin over there of, of water uh, filtration and purifiers, but um, which are totally two different things. But um, but it really depends on where I'm going, right? So or the time of year, because like where the, we were the, in BC, the time, of, the time of year. Obviously, when it's runoff, I mean, even if the water's really good in that area, which a lot of times, a lot of times you could drink out a lot of the natural springs, but when it's runoff. Like you're gonna get, you know, I've had several friends that get beaver fever because they're like, "This is fine." What's yeah. beaver fever? Well, well it's pretty much like. Um, I mean, I, there's. I don't know. Probably I think two you could probably shit it. on that garage door over there from right here if you wanted to. <laughs> I, I couldn't tell you medically what it is, but basically, it's 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 a water. It, yeah, like if there's beaver dams and stuff like that, like yeah, and and it'll affect you. I, if I recall correctly, it'll affect you a lot quicker than Giardia, and you'll wish you were dead. Yeah, and it so takes about if, a day is all. And Just if you're full, in the back country. Full stream diarrhea. Yeah. And if you're in the back country, so, you know, and you have diarrhea. You'll be like dehydrated. You're going to start dehydrating yeah. yourself. Like, it's not a good deal. No. So no, you need to kind good. of protect yourself. and. Uh, so you have to know where you're going, and then you have to know, you know, like I said, there's times where, where we were. There's natural springs where, you know, during, during moose season when – you know, it's not runoff. There's natural springs where literally I've, you know, a lot of the locals learn those areas. There's little pipes coming out. Yeah. You can fill your bottles up. You know, you kind of go by there every few days, fill up. But then you wouldn't do that same thing for a spring bear hunt if if it's runoff. You know, if there's runoff and there's obvious, you know, melting, casting across everything, then at that point it's, it's pretty tainted if the runoff's at the right phase. So yeah. you kind of have to – you know, you have to know where you're going and what those situations are like. Some of the areas where we were in France, we would have been fine with some of the spring water that was up there. Oh, you know, yeah. But then there was other areas where obviously once you get down, like if we went down into oh, yeah. the bottom of the valleys <laughs> uh, below the pig farms, yeah, no you're doubt. not going to be diving into that. I don't drink I mean? any water from the lowlands. Even in Alaska, I didn't, you know, if you're yeah. going after moose or something like that. But if I'm up in the uh, up in the high country, mule deer or sheep or mountain goat or something like that, if it's coming off, if I can see that it's coming off a snow field, you know, I, I, I may I may not choose to filter it. Certainly in the winter, if I'm just melting snow for water, yeah. I don't melt the snow and then and then filter it. You know, I, I just use that as the as the as a water source. But it, you know, it's important because you want to stay hydrated, so yep. you you need to drink enough. That shouldn't be a component where you're like, well, I'm I'm not going to drink today because I couldn't you know have an effective way of, of purifying water it's like that's not that's not a good excuse see i go through a lot of fluids so i'm always i wouldn't go somewhere even when we're even if i'm bear hunting i have you know probably two liters of water just for a day's bear hunt so i wouldn't go somewhere like that if i if i know that i need tabs to to clean my water i need to be a day ahead of that yeah I mean, if you're going there and saying, damn, I'm thirsty, then obviously tabs were a very poor option for you because and you're your planning not, sucked. Yeah, your planning sucked. You need to be like, okay, 
you know, I'm going to take something, I'm going to take a one gallon bladder, fill this thing up, put tabs in it. And then now I have a gallon to last me through the next day. And at the end of the day, I'm going to fill this thing up again. again. I'm going to drop these in at night in the morning. I'm going to be able to fill up for my day. I mean, when I would use tabs, that's what it'd be. The straw would be with me just in case it's like, I got, I got to drink right now. I have to drink right now. And that's there, what it was. Is there any water purification you would avoid, any type? Or just uh, ha- have something but just know the limitations of it? Is there I, anything I, you would I, – I think more importantly people un- need to understand the limitations of it. Okay. Right? Yeah. And and so that's from a guy who went on a sheep hunt with a buddy and all we brought was tabs because we thought we were badasses. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, and then like three days – Oh, the best lessons. And then like three days into it because I was bored and it was storming outside and I read the package and it said you have to wait four hours. And I'm like – that would have been good to know about three days ago because we were giving it like 15 minutes and we never got anything, you know, but, yeah. but I mean, you which got, is called luck. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? You can't count on luck all the time. Yeah. So Dudley was with me when I offered a Canadian guy a choice of, you he could either give me his last bottle of water. Or I was going to take it. <laughs> <laughs> He's profusely yeah, sweating in a set of galoshes and a onesie at that time. I would have <laughs> drank that water right out of his boots. <laughs> Like, I probably would have just got my straw out and just went for the boot water. <laughs> that was the day Dudley had his first kill cliff. Yeah, oh, yeah. It was. <laughs> God damn, that tasted so much better than than hot pill water. Oh, man. <laughs> so here's what maybe a good one to end it on, the survival stuff. Because We're not even close. Well, all right. Jeez, why are you wanting to get out of here? Ultimately, what I would like to be good at is cutting tracks and going where the signs lead me. This will obviously require spending lots of time in the big woods, which New England is full of. I'm absolutely committed to this style of hunting, but I'm looking to gain more skills in survival. I know you're doing some upcoming podcasts with Dudley and Barklow about survival. My question is, where can I go to gain skills and experience on how to survive in the wilderness? Because asking questions to people who can answer them is great. Yeah. But not everybody's question is going to get answered. So where would you start people on their journey to educate themselves? We got to do that, man. Do what? We gotta do. We gotta do an experience. I don't know if anybody would survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it'd be fun trying. Yeah, everyone would be dead of hi- dehydration <laughs> by the second night. I know. I'd be fine, but they might die. We need. If we had a class of ten, we'd probably need nine IVs. I was thinking fourteen, but. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but I get this one too. I mean, I know some stuff about survival. I know you know some stuff about survival, Dud, and Barclo knows a ton, but. You went places to learn those things? I did. I, I went to, yeah, that's I went to civilian. For the most part, I went to civilian schools. I went around the country. Yep. So if somebody know. has nothing, where would you? What was the best one you ever went to? Or like to fill in 12 months of what you would do in 12 months. Uh, it, so first of all, I don't know if I could say there was any specific one. Yeah. There's common themes, right? And I think mm-hmm. those are the things you need to take. But, you know, if I go to a survival course in the Philippines and learn jungle survival and then go down to Florida and then go to Maine and then you come up to Alaska like there's there's all the basics which I quite frankly Andy I think that's really what people need to know like people want to know when they think survival it's like what kind of plants can I eat you know and this kind of stuff and it's like dude if I'm eating plants I'm severely fucked, and uh, I didn't bring my sad phone, and I don't have my my in reach, and the SOS, you know, and the world came to an end, and I'm basically the only guy out there, yeah. and I'm fucking eating leaves. Yeah. Like, I'm kind of fucked, right? But you, know, you should know maybe in the specific area you're going, like, well, in Alaska, like, there was all kinds of berries during hunting season. So it's good to know what kind of berries you can yeah, eat you to, don't want to, pop to one supplement, you know, you. and stuff like yeah. that. But it's like, okay, how do I, can I, can I, can I purify water? Can I, can I start a fire? Um, and how do I do that? And what kind of, uh, you know, knife do I need? Do I have some basic uh, first aid? Can I build a shelter and get out of the elements? So those are basics. Prioritize those. Because so, the food part, the like food, eating, foods, eating plants would be at the very end of that list. Yeah, so they say you can go um, three hours, and I, I might have this slightly wrong but i'm pretty sure i don't three so hours three, three days th- three weeks three hours without shelter or yeah three hours without shelter three days without water three weeks without food so food is not a priority now that's not to say if you come across food that you shouldn't take advantage of it but the biggest thing is if, you, if you're truly like without any resource 
your tent, et cetera, like, and it's bad weather. Well, it doesn't have to be bad weather. It could be sun exposure, whatever. Like you need to find shelter from the elements. At that point, you need to figure out, not necessarily a fire, but I would say you need to figure out where you're going to get water. If you think you're going to be there for a prolonged amount, a prolonged amount of time and you don't already have water, then I think you need to figure out within that shelter, how do I insulate myself from the ground? Like we talked about those kind of things. Then I think depending on the resources you have, because you don't want to expend, right, all your reserves, like walking around trying to find firewood and, and do a bow drill, but maybe you want to start a fire at that point. More importantly, you need to figure out where you are, what you're doing. Do I need to signal somebody? How can I signal somebody? Food would be the very last thing, mm -hmm. right? Not, not that if a bunny comes in front of me and stands there, I'm not going to club it over the head and, and want to eat it, but I'm not going to expend all these energy reserves chasing rabbits through the woods, you know, trying to kill one when really I should be. Because your tummy's grumbling. Correct. Um, yeah. Where I Telling should be having, and... having a secure place from the elements and, and trying to and, and, and trying to, uh, you know, have some water that I procured. But Yeah, if you're a game warden listening, I'm going gangster. <laughs> I can tell well, no, you right but now. I, but I, <laughs> if so I need I, to eat, I'm going gangster. In, in, Ala in Alaska, sure. if you were in a survival situation, you know, you could do that to procure food if yeah. you needed to. Not not that, you know, you should be, you know, shooting bald eagles or anything. Yeah. But, but that's know. also Alaska. If you're yeah. out in a desert environment yeah. or high desert somewhere, it might not be a choice. But, but, but you know, to answer this gentleman's question, I would say, find a survival school either in the area you live or the area you hunt so maybe where you live yeah. is not the area you hunt but like there's and i i don't know all of them right yeah. i just know the couple that i went to but how did you find the ones you went to um basically we just we you know through our our network but we asked around and and got basically it was word of mouth okay like, who who were the most badass dudes in this environment and that's where we went and a guy you know the same guy who taught desert did not teach jungle did not teach mountain survival like they just didn't because they were specialists yeah and so they knew exactly you well know, let's simplify it though let's say there's no jungle in the u.s yeah so you just don't hypothetically have to, so you don't have to do that mississippi <laughs> 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 florida yeah okay well let's i mean who are the people within our community that you value their opinion on this subject because they'll be able to listen to those people and pick up parts like you know I would value some of the things, you know, Remy obviously mm -hmm. does it, does it well. Um, you know, are there people that you would say if, you know, if you're constantly in the outdoor community, these people give good information. These people are good writers. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you have people that you value to where you think people could get good I, general I, I i don't i not not anymore i don't I mean, either I, actually yeah that's a good question i can't think of you know, off the top of my head i was listening to a podcast uh with aaron snyder on kafaru cast and he had a gentleman on and i listened to him and he sounded i mean he seemed again i haven't trained with him but he seemed totally legit but he had a really good outlook on it i i think the other thing is people i would say if somebody asked me a survival question i'd say define survival because a lot of times what people are actually talking about is primitive living right so if they want to know how to do traps and snares and make a fish basket or a bird trap like that's more primitive living to me and most not people survival. could walk out of the woods in the time it would take them to make that <laughs> yeah. i mean seriously they no, i know they watched a lot no uh, correct or hit the sos button, yeah afraid right? or whatever in alaska like make it in afraid or something sure. like that one of those instead of whittling a, <laughs> make it in a snare for you know or whatever it is for 14 hours yeah walk to the road yeah <laughs> well, what, so, you know, what I'm confident in saying is I can build a shelter in whatever environment I'm in. I could be in snow. I could be in the desert. I can be in the jungle. I can, I can build a shelter, right? The other thing is I can build a fire in whatever conditions I'm in, which I think is hugely important because a lot of people are like, I can build a fire, and they're in the campground or in their backyard, and it's Arizona. It's 110 degrees outside, and you could look at it long enough, and it would start on fire, right? It's like, but could you do that if you're going to go to, say, do a sheep hunt in Alaska, could you do that in snow or rain or whatever it is? Like, so you want to have real solid, positive, basic skills. You know, we're talking trigger pull earlier. That's a super basic skill. But how important is that, Andy, to shooting the gun? Depends on if you want to be successful or not. Ex exactly. And so what I think most people kind of overlook is they want to gloss over the basics because they're not super sexy and get on to the more 
cool advanced stuff. But if you have no basic skills, I don't need to teach you how to build a figure four trap. Like you're never going to use it. It's fun. We could teach you that, but, but value the basics first. So if this gentleman's out and I don't know if he said where he was, but if he's tracking animals, what I would tell him is he, he better know land navigation. He better know how to run a GPS. I think one thing that's way overlooked is, is um, you know, well, when we were in Hawaii, it was hilarious because we were in the woods and that guy's like, I don't know where we are. And you just pulled out your uh, <laughs> iPhone and opened up Google Maps and you're like, uh, we need to walk 200 yards to the east, right? But, but I think map and compass yeah. and, and then, you know, overlaid GPS on top of that, like that's probably important. And then understanding the basics and, yeah. and, and what those priorities are. Is, is food my first one or shelter? You know, those kind of things and thinking through them so that if you do get there, you're not going to panic and go, no, I think I know what to do. New England is and where the, I said he is. New England, yeah. So, yeah. you know, the weather's not always great up there. Yeah, it's big woods. Obviously, big woods. that's big woods. big woods. So, I mean, it's easy to get turned around. So, to have, you know, it's easy to get turned around when everything looks the same. But I think um, one of the things that's really common in all of your replies to – the different situ, you know, conver- um, questions Andy threw at you. There's, there's probably no one perfect place to go to know it all. Yeah. But there were, there were, several things that were reoccurring in what you said: shelter, fire, hydration, food. Yep. You know, probably in the maybe in that order. Um, would you agree? Most yeah. likely. Okay, so you know. Those are four different topics that you can find people that or find a way to learn those four very, very important basic skill sets to where those are going to be more valuable than you going to a Bear Grylls two day class. Yeah. Like go somewhere, learn how to navigate, learn how to build a shelter properly based on the area either that you are or that you want to be. And, you know, be prepared to build a fire and, you know, and honestly, when it comes to, um, one of the things that I've learned is if you've been outside enough and you learn your body, knowing how to layer is almost, it's, it's like the number five, which, and it would probably go to the front of that whole line. Correct. If you don't know how to layer and go into the field to where you're going to be able to make it a full day just based on either what you have, how much you have to move, how much you have to put on once the sun goes down and the, and the inversion happens. If you don't know how to deal with that, that's a big problem. I mean, because you're, you're literally going to freeze to death because you don't have the right clothes and you don't have no idea what to do. I yeah. mean, I've had a lot of people that are like, well, you know, I just went out and just had this on. It's like, well, shit, dude, don't you know? It drops 30 degrees at night, and you're out here with spandex on. I mean, this is kind of stupid, you know? <laughs> I mean, you, you didn't want to pack something that actually has an insulation value for when it's dark, and now we have four miles back out of here. Right. You know, yeah, we're going to be moving, but shit, dude, what if – what if you shot a bull? We got to sit here and freaking cut on this thing for three hours and then start making trips. You know, you need to be able to, to think ahead. You ha- you have to know. And what a lot of people pack is far less than me. I'm actually, because I'm so tall, like, you know, my feet and hands and, you know, my lower legs, they get colder than most people that are in shorter in stature. And because of that, I have to bring one layer more than a lot of people if I'm in a stagnant position and that's just how it is or I have to know if I want to survive I need to keep moving if we're going to stop I need to stop and make fire because I'm fine moving but when I stop I don't have enough right now to stay warm unless someone has that that they don't need you know I think that's like number one on that list and then it falls into those four basic elements to learn to do those four things good and you're going to be able to make it out of there. Yeah. I mean, you know, we are, it's not like, you know, I don't think most of the people asking these questions are trying to go to like the northern parts of Russia where, you know, no one's seen a person in a while. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, well, so uh, I think we talked about it on your podcast, but, you know, me and uh, Preston and uh, what was the other guy's name? Trevor? Which no, one? The guide. 
Oh, Dusty? No, the other guy. Bert? Bert. Oh. I can't believe I forgot Bert's name. <laughs> no kidding. But, you know, we got dropped off in the boat, right? And so, Andy, obviously, this is, you know, right up your alley. Like, oh, you get dropped off on a boat, and the boat will be back. Why didn't you guys swim to shore? And the boat, uh, I wanted to, but Bert couldn't swim. All right, so, fair enough. He could have held onto the dry um, bag. And Preston was crying, I think. But <laughs> He could have stayed in the boat. Um, then you're you know, get dropped off on the beat. Your mouth. <laughs> get dropped off on the boat, and it's like, oh, no, the, you know, they'll be right back. And so we go and we go and, uh, you know, make that stock on the bear while they dropped you guys off way up at the end of the mm -hmm. end of the bay. And I'm waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. And Bert's getting upset, you know, and this and that. And, and I'm just sitting there. I'm like, okay, this is going to suck if the boat doesn't come back. But <laughs> I've got a puffy jacket. I've got a bit of a ground pad. I've got a tarp. I've got everything I need to make a fire. And I've got a couple water tabs, right? And obviously, you got food in your pack. Yeah. So it's not going to be like a life and death situation. Really, at that point, I wouldn't call it survival. I would call it, what is my level of comfort going to be while I wait here overnight while the boat gets fixed or gets refueled or you know what I'm saying? But So that be kind of honest. Thing. What percentage of you wanted the boat not to come back so other people Zero. would suffer more? <laughs> no, no. It's not so you wouldn't suffer. It's so that other people who were less prepared suffered more. Well, I wouldn't have minded staying there except <laughs> I wanted to go on another stock. But let's put it this way. I know I was going to be warm and dry. <laughs> uh, I wasn't so sure about the other two because they didn't bring anything with them. Yeah. Right. And I've just learned enough that it's like I got to bring, I just bring the basics, you know. But, uh, you know, is that a survival situation? No, we'd have, like, we'd have done it. But yeah. what is your level of discomfort? Yeah, but that would have turned into one. It could have very easily. But yeah. that's argument. I mean, there's an argument there for that. I would say that wasn't really even a survival situation because worst case scenario, like maybe I'm wrong by doing this. I feel like I could have, I probably would have just headed straight north and made the, th you know, hit the three miles and been on the north side of that island and then oh, been yeah. on the shore to where I at least under, I had landmarks I knew and I could either go to camp or I could go to where the barge was. Well, I had my GPS on me. I knew where we were and where yeah. camp was, but I don't know if, you know, I don't know if Bert could have walked back there. So I'm not saying it was a survival situation. I'm saying if that boat never came back, it would be a it would be a scenario where being prepared would make it less sucky, right? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have made a, it, it wouldn't have made it a matter of life and death immediately. Correct. Correct. Now mind you, where we got dropped off or we or the beach we were going to get extracted from like a giant pretty good sized grizzly had just walked through there you know so that would have that it would have got western then you know if that would have started you know I mean, you, you could see how that would you were play definitely out, gonna but, be able to outrun birds. but i, I carry <laughs> like enough you, and trevor just, had the same thing right like we we carried enough well the one time prepared. you didn't and you were pissed i was pissed because i left my pack on the boat he I'm like, left God his damn pack it, i know i know better he left his pack you in know? the boat. day one shit barclow it is day one shit and i i i have to relearn <laughs> lessons just like everybody else but yeah the only thing I would add, I think everything you guys said is awesome, is that I would never want to discourage people from going into the field a little bit without the basics. Like if they have an understanding of their limitation and their gap, just respect that and set up the things like the drop dead time, letting people know where you are, having a plan for everything, and just really boundary yourself. Go get some experience in the field, but don't go Bear grills crazy if you live, uh, I don't know, in downtown New York and you want to go try to start a fire with a string bow it's not yeah a it's not going to happen let's just say there's some editing involved in those sequences <laughs> but don't not go out in the woods just respect and be self-aware of where your skill level actually is you, you have to get experience I, yeah. I i encourage everyone go get experience like Smartly. at the end of the day yeah but at the end of the day that's the only way you're going to get better at this stuff it's no different than practice in archery you know if if you want to do that you don't do it if you want to go bow hunting and shoot an elk with your bow, don't go the day of season elk yeah. hunting. Yeah. Don't go buy a bow the day before and then go out elk hunting. Or just shoot spots at 20 yards for a, yeah. with field points. I mean, and think if you're you gonna want be... to start doing this stuff, then what you should do is you should take, like right now in the summer is the best time, or during shed season, take a trip out there to where all the elements aren't against you and just say, I'm going to go out there and camp for the weekend. And then all of a sudden you realize, man, I came out here and I didn't have this and I had to drive back to town to get it. Yeah. If you do that three or four times a year 
and you just tell yourself, I want to go out there and I want to not have to need my car, my phone, or my electricity for today. I'm going to do it for a full day. And then the next time do it for two, then do it for three. Yeah. It's like you do it that way if enough times, you do it a few times, then, you know, you're all of a sudden going to understand, okay, you know, here's what I need to do. No different than when you're a kid and, you know, your parents put a tent out and you wanted to sleep in the backyard. You go out there and realize, Dad, I'm cold, and you come back in. Well, next time you have some blankets. Well, then the <laughs> next time you leave the screen open and think the bugs are terrible. So, yeah, I mean, you, you just learn all these little things, and that's what you yeah. have to do. Do it during the summertime. Come out for a scouting trip. You know, come out for shed season. You know, I told – um Several of the guys that wanted to come in my area for whitetail hunting, they're like, well, hey, you know, what, what's the best time to come for whitetails? And I said, the best time is turkey season. And they're like, what? That's great advice right there. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, you need to put in for a turkey tag in the spring. You need to come out here, and you need to – the foliage is off. You can see how shit lays, and you need to come out here, and you need to develop a plan on what you want to do for whitetail season. But don't ask me in September yeah. where's the best place for me to come whitetail hunting. If you want to come whitetail hunting, come during turkey season. I think it's that's a excellent time. advice. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I would also say maybe out west. Come for gonna, bear season. Because I was going to say spring bear is a great time for yep. people to come out, especially if they're back from back east. But even out a lot here in of the west, like, in the middle I, of try, the day. I try new gear and stuff out because you have, one, I mean, the weather can be snotty, but it's not – most of the time so snotty that not middle of the winter snotty. it's not yep. going to improve the days are a little longer and you know i don't discount bears i love spring bear hunting but if you drew a great elk tag like i'd rather learn my lessons on a spring bear hunt yeah. than on that elk tag in september <laughs> yeah right? hell yeah so yeah. but that that the the turkey hunting is uh that's a great yeah. that's a great uh bit of advice next question <sighs> all right you guys want to do another one are you here in barclow fine mm -hmm. okay I can hear him a little bit, but not great. I can always hear him I can him hear fine. you good. I don't know what to tell you about that. Heat I've stroke. Seen. All right. I figure most of the questions <laughs> you'll be receiving for these situations will be more cold weather oriented due to the hunting aspect. But I wanted to ask a survival question about the other side of the spectrum. I was doing some backpacking in July in the maze of Canyonlands NP. Do you know where that is, Barklow? Yeah, well, Northern Utah. Peninsula. Northern Peninsula? What is the NP? Uh, National Park. Hmm. Canyonlands National Park. Oh, what did he say on the first part? The maze of Canyonlands. Oh, MP. I didn't hear that part. And had a situation which I was becoming unsure whether or not I was experiencing symptoms of heat stroke slash heat exhaustion. I it, think that's the silent killer, actually. It was definitely a scary experience having uh, that happen in such a remote environment like the maze, and I feel like both recognition and treatment of this type of scenario could have been much more difficult when solo. Yes, it definitely would be. Fortunately, I was with a partner this time, but I like going out alone. Any of you guys' thoughts would be great. <laughs> Survival expert, John Barklow. You, 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 you may know uh, as much, if not more, than me being a second phase instructor about heat stroke and heat exhaustion. Yeah, yeah it is silent. Yeah, it, it is I definitely think once, silent. Once you know you have it's, it, it's, it's too late. That, well, that's the problem. Once is it? you yeah. know yeah. you have it, you're screwed. It happened to me on a billy goat hunt. Really? Well, yeah. did you recognize it or did somebody else? I actually recognized it once I said, I got to sit down. And I realized, like, my right eye it was just, like, going down. And I just – I literally got wow. to, like, an extreme version of altitude sickness with dehydration. And then I was just shut down. It's like I need to – I knew I needed to hydrate, but that's not a quick recovery. No. Yep. I mean, when you hydrate, it was four or five hours of – I need to let all this stuff catch back up. Plus, and core body—you got to lower the core body temperature too. That's where the ice baths in the second phase tank. Yeah, they could be oh, yeah. full yeah. submersion, but not crazy. Like, put them in the water first, mm -hmm. then add a little bit of ice, then continue adding ice while trying to hydrate. They're getting an IV thrown in them at the same time. Uh, yeah, but if you don't have that and you're just trying to hydrate based on what you have on a hill, it takes a long time. It is. It is a long time. Shade. If you can get somewhere where they're – just think of, like, what a dog would do. You know, if yep. you can get somewhere where there's cool dirt, get, you know, get under some rocks, you know, get somewhere where there's cool dirt to where you can try to obviously lower your your body temperature while hydrating. But I mean, Well, let's go even farther back. 
but but I tips think it, for avoiding in the first place. I was going to yeah, say, I, th- I, think, I, I think you need to understand maybe how to avoid it and then – Layering I, actually plays into this as well too. And I'll try to remember some of the, the classic signs and symptoms. The, the, the funny thing with the, the classic signs and symptoms of uh, – uh, heat stroke. And, Isn't and, it almost uh, the same as O2 toxicity? The vision blurry, ears ringing, nausea, all well, that I, stuff. I, I That's on the extreme side. I, I wasn't going to go there. I was just going to say that hypothermia and and heat stroke, hypothermia and hyperthermia are are uh, the, I mean they're basically it's like you're drunk. And yeah, so they're bro ha- and sis. Ha- half the time when we're hanging out, it's hard to tell if somebody's got hyperthermia or or just drunk, or if they're right? pussy, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> but but you know you, you start three, you start yeah, to uh, sure. but you know you start to get you start to get confusion and you know the biggest one with because he specifically talked about heat stroke. You'll notice you're slowing is, down, it, it, but when you stop sweating because you've been sweating, which is your body's natural right reaction to you know put moisture on your skin to kind of promote that convective heat loss, and all of a sudden you stop sweating like that is. If I recall correctly, that is where you're really kind of effed up because to kind of try to reverse that well, it's late is, into the game is is really difficult. But you know, and how- avoiding that, like when I go into the field, I know in five minutes if I messed up on what I'm wearing. Yeah, because you're profusely like if you. Yeah, whatever you're you, approaching it, this question from the best direction. Yeah, like you go into the field and five minutes in, you're profusely sweating with not a lot of effort. You need to stop and readdress and reevaluate what it is that you're wearing. Like, uh, I know people who've had Gore-Tex on and didn't realize it. You know, that's yeah. not awesome yeah. for yeah. allowing moisture to wick away. And it's like, you need, like what what I put myself into the field. I would rather – I try to put myself on the edge of being uncomfortably cold when I start moving with the mm-hmm. goal of being not hot, not even warm, but right flirting with the edge of I'm not cold, but I'm not I don't warm, want right my, in that zone. I don't want my sweat to freeze on me. I don't want to sweat, actually, if I can. I want to ride that edge We right were on that edge I'm, the entire time in, in France. France. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, when, you're, when your <laughs> that pitch was, is 89 degrees. <laughs> no, we were seriously on that line oh, yeah. of – how do you not dress enough to where you, your fingers aren't, for, you know, to where mm-hmm. you're not having frostbite? Yeah. But if I put on any more, I'll sweat I'm sweating too much, and then I'm going to be colder. This, I know if we say there's a chamois and we have to get down in glass, in within 20 minutes, my teeth, my teeth are going to be chattering. Right. Yeah. So you have to know that line. Yep. But I think the the key to hunting is. The ability to continually hydrate. I mean, and and literally recognizing heat, ex, you know, hyperthermia, um, or you know, I guess uh, dehydration. If you're um, hyperthermia, I think all that stuff comes down to having cool water, and you know, and recognizing how much you're actually sweating out yeah, versus you what you're putting that, in. Yeah. And then uh, the other thing is. You know, when you start to when you start to feel like you're you know you're tripping up, or you know you're little you know you start bumping logs and kind of st- you know those are all like early signs. Those are early signs of a form of exhaustion. Yep, you start to lose coordination. Yep. Uh, you know, I like to say people need to be a willing participant in the activity, right? And so, if you and I are going out, and I don't know what this person if they're referring you know directly to hunting or just hiking around canyon lands but more just recognizing i think heat stroke heat exhaustion yeah but you know so you can you know you can choose when you want to go hike so you want to go hike in the heat of the day or you want to you know start (laughs) early in the morning yeah you know how much water not only do you bring but how much water did you take on board to kind of uh you know inflate your cells before you left right if you need to understand that if i'm going to all of a sudden go, man, I'm thirsty, and I'm going to chug a liter of ice-cold water, it's going to sit in my gut, and the, it's not going to, it's not going to, the gastric emptying is not going to be quick as much as, okay, I put something in that water, and I just continually take small sips to where I put it in my, in my gut, it's assimilated quickly. I put it in my gut, it's assimilated quickly, right? Yeah. You know, what, what are you eating? So if you throw a bunch of food in your, in your belly, and then you put water 
like that water has it's going to go to the digestion of that food before it you know goes to your muscles and things like that so but you're an active participant so to your point if you're hiking and you're sweating your ass off you have the choice to slow down yeah right you or have the choice or to take did, off yeah. the clothes right and so it, it it's this constant like I don't know if people just assume that we go out there and because we've done it so much that we don't think about this stuff. It's all that's running through my mind, yeah. right? It's like, oh, better better take this off. Oh, better add this back, right? It's this constant like regulating just like a gas pedal on a truck. Like it's the same thing, going too fast, going too slow, putting on a layer, rolling up sleeves, taking off a layer. You know, all these things that you're trying to do. Well, that's why I like the stuff you guys make. It's got zippers and the armpits on some stuff. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to stop to take this off, but I'm going to vent the inside of my legs and my armpits. And then when I stop, the puffy jacket comes out and it goes on. It like, yeah, it's um, – I've learned my lesson the hard way. First trip I ever did in Kodiak, we went on a snowshoe, mm -hmm. and I was all excited and just <laughs> – and the easiest place to be on a snowshoe, actually, I agree – or I believe this from walking point is the guy up front because I knew the pace and I knew the route and I knew when I was going to stop and everybody else in the back is like, God damn it. Will you just slow down? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so you're right. trying to keep up. And so then you start sweating and you start sweating in that Arctic environment, which I did on my first snowshoe, my first trip there. And then we stopped for like an hour and it was the pendulum swing from sweating to freezing my ass yeah. off occurred <laughs> in about five minutes. And I was yep. miserable. I'm like, Oh my God. I think a lot of times the, uh, um, that first day when you're in a new area is the toughest because you don't technically know the pace or the prep. Like after the first day in France, by the time you came in, you and I had a checklist. Um, I kind of had a checklist for you by the first day, but then by the third day, you and I were in check with one another, which is important when you're hunting yeah. with someone yep. in camp. I was telling him, I said, hey, do you have, do you have two endurers? And I said, and you said, yeah. And then I said, okay, I got, you said, I got two, two bottles of water, two endures. So I said, okay, I got four, four waters because it's not just water. When you're like, the when you're, when stuff, you're sweating yeah. hard and you know, you look at your hat and if you have a black hat and it's completely white, that's, that's mineral loss too, and electrolyte yeah. loss, which you need. Those are, those all play into every single one of these negative things that we talked about. Plus Hunter with the gastric emptying. Yeah, well, I mean, he, was he was the was worst yet. <laughs> Purging <laughs> everything that he had. Well, he, well, here's the thing. You know, you do need to recognize there's a couple things there. One, um, you know, if you're in a camp where you're also having a lot of fun, too, and you're, you know, you're partying, you go out after a night of drinking like, like we do most of the time. You need to plan and, for it. Yeah, and then you don't, you know, you don't end the night with hydration and start your morning with hydration you're putting yourself in a very negative situation off the get-go. If you go out, you know, you have some beers, you have some drink, you know, if, say there's five of you in elk camp and someone shoots a bull on the first night, everyone comes back, you pack that bull out, you know, it didn't seem that hard, but you came back, everyone's eating late, you freaking have some celebration drinks, you know, you guys stay up a little bit late, you get up, you know, you've had two hours less sleep that night, so you get up early so the, the other four guys can go out. You know, you get up, you're a little bit slow going to it, but you're still excited. You make a big pot of coffee. You take some coffee, you're drinking coffee as you go out. You're dicked. Yeah. You're 60% in the dehydration. You're totally, yeah. like, right there, that doesn't sound like that's that bad of a thing. But what I just said, you are, if if you're not on top of that ball game, hydrating and sipping, like from the start of that morning, especially on an elk hunt, if you just did it the way that I just said, you are in for a bad day the next day by midday because you're already in the negative. I yep. mean, you're going out there, you know, coffee before hydration isn't good on, a, you know, an exertion type element. It's one thing if you get up, hydrate, have coffee, you know, because we all would, um, but if you neglect that hydration portion and, you know, I'm, that's why I'm such an advocate on kill cliff in the hunting situations, man, because they just, the vitamins and the electrolytes and stuff. You should have seen stuff. his face. The first one we had laying on the clay <laughs> by a red truck. Soaking into my body. Canadian was 
upturning his boot and it just was pouring out like <laughs> Niagara Falls. And Dolly was just, <laughs> what is this stuff? <laughs> yeah, that was that was like when I had my first Coca Cola as like a five year old. I was like, my eyes totally changed. What? Yeah. <laughs> So What's, for this person, I, I think, yeah. It, we covered it. We did. Yeah. It, stay ahead of it. And I'll be honest, like the uh, – Pick like, Your Times, too, was a very valid point. It's, that one, and I like going out alone. I get that. Um, I like doing stuff on my own a lot as well, too. But you have to recognize the danger that's involved with that as well, too. Yeah. So then it goes back to you need to let somebody know. You need to have a drop-dead time. You need to have a communication plan. And if you're going to go out in the desert, like, I mean, I don't think I would recommend that. I mean, do it if you want to. Yeah. It's, I would say it's not no, advisable. It sounds foolish. I mean, I've, I've hunted a lot by myself. And like I said, I put my poor wife through probably more, you know, worry than she needed. Just, it's just on my private side, right? Just going out hunting, let alone my professional life. But, um, but you also have to be, if I'm, if I'm climbing by myself or skiing by myself, I've done a lot of that. You have to be more conservative. You actually have to understand that there's really good point. There is more you are taking on more responsibility and you know, you don't I'm not talking about pushing the ragged edge, but but you you have to be willing to accept more responsibility and back off of what your limit is because there is no extra help. And quite frankly, it's it's completely uh bullshit if you think, well, I'm gonna go out by myself and push a ragged edge, and I'll just hit the SOS button, and somebody will come save me. Like, that's not, that's yeah. not the let's solution assuming either. Let's hit it. Let's assuming not you can hit it, right? Go down there. Yeah. So, yeah, but that's there's a there's a responsibility you have when you do go mindset. out yourself that, that you just you need to be able to try to manage more of those things than if you had a buddy there to yeah. help you, you know? You need to stay really far away from what I would consider to be your 50% level Yeah, you need if to, you're by yourself. Yeah. The time to strap on nine GoPros and go big or go YouTube is not when you're by yourself. No. If you no. want to live, at least. Yeah. Yeah, there's been a lot of hunting situations where people are like, you know, you're looking at an animal where you know if you pushed it, you could get to it. And there's been times where I've been by myself and I'm like, I know I can get over that hill and I know I can get a shot at dark, but then what does that mean? Yep. Like, yeah. what does that mean? Yeah. That means... I'm there an hour further from where I am. That means, you know, for me to get back to what I need is going to be this time for mm-hmm. me to get back or route. And, I, you know, it just gets to the point where you're like, okay, this, as much as I want to do that, that's not the good decision right now. Yeah. I mean, I can't I, make I that decision. I had pushed a day, a, a day hard to get into an area to go hunt in Alaska. And... I finally climbed up into this basin, and I am not, like, this is, I mean, what are the odds, right? And I climb up into this basin, and as soon as I start glassing the basin, there's a giant brown bear right in the middle of the basin, right in the middle of it, right? And I'm like, okay, I think I can manage that, because I'm by myself. So I'm like, okay, I think I can manage that, because I can kind of keep track of him, and I can kind of keep my wind, and I can, I can, I can manage that. I like all these kind of Right. Yes. Well, it is. <laughs> and then, so I'm glassing some more, and sure enough, coming down the ridge, which would be t- if I'm glassing this big brown bear in the middle, to the left, here comes another bear, another boar. And he's coming down the ridge. And at this point where I am, like, there's nowhere to go. I either drop into the basin and the big boar in the middle sees me. I stay where I am, and this brown bear runs into me, or I got to backtrack where I came from. And I, I, and I had time to think about this, and I'm kind of piecing it together. And the best thing I could come up with was the smaller bear coming down the ridge had just had his ass kicked by the big bear in the middle of the basin. And it probably didn't want to see me sitting on this ridge. And I was like, you know what? If I was with somebody else, we could probably manage this differently. And I felt I had no choice but to just get the hell out of there yep. yeah. and go, you know, half a day back the way I came. And it's just... That was that was what I had to do because that was the responsibility that I had taken on with the challenge of going out there by myself, right? So you just have to kind of you just have to kind of manage that a little bit differently. Yeah, covered. Yeah. That's two hours of survival one hundred and one. Anything else you two want to add before we do survival one hundred and two in five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> For three hours? What time is it? 
Uh, I actually think people are going to show up relatively soon, oh, yeah. so we got to wrap it up. Oh, yeah. We actually covered quite a bit, though. Some shooting stuff, hot, cold, gear, sleeping bag, get experience. I think we covered quite a bit. I think we did. Yeah. Yeah. Told a story or two. And there's like seven times more questions. And some more. Oh, there's way more. We'll do, we'll do in uh, Park City, we'll do 102. Yeah, let's do Park City 102, and then we'll uh, definitely do three in September. Mm-hmm. 103. From okay. Backcountry. We'll whisper. That'll be a quiet one. Yeah. No headsets. <laughs> like, why don't we see any animals? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we're talking really loud. <laughs> I think we tag out the first day, all three of us. And Perfect. Then That's what four days of podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> all right, boys. That's it. Thanks a lot, everybody. As always, appreciate all the feedback, the emails. This particular episode uh, it specifically wouldn't have been possible without your feedback and without your questions. So thank you for sending them in. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else is new before I close it out for the week. Uh, the Black Ops t-shirt. Did a version of the Be the Example shirt. Really, the only difference is, is the color of the writing, which is in a camouflage pattern on front and back. Same logo on front, same words on the back. Cleared hot on the front. Be the Example on the back. Thanks. Uh, thank you to everybody who has already purchased the shirt. It allows me to do some awesome stuff with the podcast, buy some new gear, travel, talk to some new people. The next few weeks are all going to be sit down. I don't want to say interviews. Uh, we'll say conversations uh, from a variety of different uh, backgrounds. Everything from extreme sports to alpinism to snowboarding. And, and actually next week will be our first female guest. Haven't been able to get my wife to agree to do it just yet. Still working on that. But our first female guest will be next week. And I will wait till announce uh, who that is until next week because I would like it to be a surprise. Thank you for the support. Thank you for the feedback. Thank you for the reviews on iTunes. Uh, if I could ask you to do anything for me, tell somebody about the podcast. And if you'll...